Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dental Show. It is Sunday evening, and um, I'm glad that you have joined. You've taken your time out to join me on the Dental Show this evening. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody that's supporting the Dental Show live. I really, really appreciate you. I must say a big thank you to Vesta London Beauty for her lip gloss. This is called Baby Girl. Um, she's a young entrepreneur, so please go out there and purchase one of these lip glosses. Um, let me put her website details up so at least you can go on there and support, um, you know, entrepreneurs who are starting out, who are, you know, trying to make a living out of this COVID-19. So please go out there, purchase one of these lip glosses and support, um, you know, young entrepreneurs, young people that are trying to, you know, build their wealth at a young age. Um, so Vesta London Beauty, she's got all different types of colors. Um, so go online and, you know, grab one. And I must say a big thank you to um, Prodigy Foods. This is Cassie's Classics. Um, she does an all purpose seasoning. Um, she does shito, she does um, different spices and one for your jollof, the one for jollof rice. If, you're, if you love jollof rice like me, you need to make sure that you get one. Um, so that's the website on the um, on the screen as well. Make sure that you go out there and grab one. Um, it's really, really good. This is the all purpose seasoning. And again, a young entrepreneur that is, you know, doing really, really well. So I hope that you enjoyed last week's show. And this week we are talking about uh, democracy. Is it our solution as Africa? Um, we're going to be talking about governance. We're going to be talking about power. And we're going to be talking about leadership. And I have some amazing people that I'm going to be speaking to today. Um, before we carry on, I want to see where every where are my people? Okay, Eben is here. Uh, Romeo, I want to see where you guys are watching me from. I always want to know. So, Geldon Griffin is watching us from New York. He sends his love from New York. Um, Mr. Jemai, where are you watching us from? Khadija's on here. Kwame, Kwame, how are you too? Um, who else is here? We've got Nancy. Um, guys, make sure that you are sharing your pages as well. You know, on Facebook, you can do like a watch party. So share your page, do a watch party with somebody. And if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure that you click the subscribe button and share the pages on Facebook, um, on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever. Just keep sharing um, your pages so that we can make sure that, you know, everything that we are learning on The Dentar Show is not just for you, it's for everyone. So let's spread the word, let people get the knowledge, the information. Um, okay, so I've got Columbia, Craden from Columbia. Um, I've got, wow, I've got... Shirley, Auntie Shirley's here. She's in the UK. I've got Hanson. He's in London, Delaware. Wow. Oh, we've got loads of people watching us. Guys, make sure that you share your page, your Instagram, um, post it on Instagram, post it on Twitter, post it on Facebook, and make sure that, you know, we get everybody watching the Dental Show tonight. Um, it's about, what, like I said, it's about democracy. Is it our solution? We're talking about governance. We're talking about leadership. Um, so make sure that, you know, you, you share that with somebody else. So I'm going to go ahead and, oh, before I go ahead, actually, make sure that you subscribe to Tap Tap Send. Tap Tap Send, if you are in Europe, you can download the app and use Denta as your short code, as your promo code, and then you get £5 to send to a loved one. So, you know, so just imagine if you was going to send somebody a hundred pound, um, the person can get 105 pound. So, um, or you're going to send 95, the five pound can add it can be a hundred pound. So, um, make sure that you download tap, tap, send and use the Dentar promo code to make sure that you give a loved one an extra five pound. Um, I don't know whether you've heard about Private Hammond. Private Hammond is a 95-year-old man who Guba Foundation and Forces Help Ghana are trying to raise money um, to support him. Um, well, he's trying to raise money to support frontline workers and vulnerable veterans in Ghana and well, Af Africa, Commonwealth, every African country that's in the Commonwealth is part of the Commonwealth. Um, so far, he has raised nearly 40,000. We're at 39,600 or so. Um, he wants to raise 500,000. Um, he's recently been awarded by the Queen. Um, he's going to be re-awarded again. There's so many things happening with him. 
Um, and so, you know, it's a good time for you guys to also support him. Um, we've got a Just Giving link that you can support. Um, and for those of you that are watching that are looking at investment opportunities, that are looking to connect with other Africans, that are looking for job opportunities, make sure that you register at odanaconnect.com. Odanaconnect.com. You can register now and um, you'll get all the information. Without further ado, I'm going to start introducing my guests, which I know that you're all eagerly waiting for. Um, and who should I start with? Hmm. I think I'm going to start with a female, you know, ladies first and all of that. Yeah, I think I think it's appropriate. And I think Palgrave and Martin agree with me. I can see them nodding, saying, yes, yes, Denta, you're correct. This one, dear, you're correct. <laughs> so let me introduce you to a special person, actually, because even though you're going to be meeting her, she's actually our trustee for Gruber Foundation. Um, so let me just put her beautiful face on the screen and tell you all about my trustee, who is an amazing person. Um, I met her, I think, two years ago now. Um, and funny enough, um, one of our Gruber members, who um, uh, George Amiel, who's our head of PR marketing, used to teach her. Yes, used to teach her. It was just like, oh my goodness, like, you know, one of those unreal moments where you're talking and then, you know, a conversation comes up and it's just like George and me, our Uncle George, like everybody that I, I know seems to know him and he's, an, he's a wonderful person as well. So Yvonne Abba Opoku, ACG, is a director at Health and Heartfelt Philanthropy Network. Um, she is a chartered gov um, governance professional. And guess what? She, like, when we say that somebody's at the top of a game, like she's at the top of a game, she works as a governance advisor to a group of companies linked to his Royal Highness Prince of Wales and other non-profit companies registered in the UK and in Ghana. Yvonne specializes in enhancing governance standards, managing brands and charitable funds, as well as associated reputable risks. So, I mean, when we talk about governance, when we talk about leadership, she's somebody that can actually give us advice and give us, you know, the right ways in which we should be doing things. So without further ado, please welcome my trustee, Yvonne. Hi, Yvonne. Hi, Delta. How are you? I'm very well. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. Thank you so much for joining me on tonight's show. You're welcome. Okay, so, you know, I want to get to know a little bit more about you before, you know, we dive into tonight's topic. Now, funny enough, when I was listening to your interview on Instagram the other day, and um, mm -hmm. you were talking about, you know, some of the things that you've done, and what struck yeah. me was about, you know, how um, the Sainsbury's thing that you went through. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. I just want to, I want you to talk about, you know, determination, you know, I want you to talk about not giving up. Um, I, you know, I get a lot of people, um, young people watching this channel, and I feel like sometimes our stories and in, in the way our journeys are and the way we get to certain places, I want them to know that it is not easy. Um, but at the same time, you have to be persistent and, consist and consistent. Yeah. Um, and so if you can share a little bit about your journey and how you managed to be, you know, um, I mean, the role that you're in now um, and also, you know, how you started your own work um, as well. So if we can start from there, that would be great. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that interview on Instagram. And mm. for me, it was quite refreshing because when people meet me, you know, the first question they ask is, how did you, you know, how did you get this amazing role, you know, supporting or, you know, giving governance advice to members of the royal family. So it was quite refreshing that on that particular interview, you know, simply Andy asked me where I started, you know, and, and, and I think it's a very important part of my journey. And I really enjoyed sharing that, you know, so I, you know, I applied for a job at Sainsbury's, you know, to sell cheese on the cheese counter. We have to go through, you know, we have to go through an assessment process to see whether we can do simple mathematics and various things, you know. 
I just wanted a student's job, basically, so I can just focus on, you know, my master's and doing my work and stuff. And I remember going to the job centre and, you know, did the assessment, and then I was then told that I had failed the test. And then I looked up to the lady and I said, can you please remark the test? Because I'm too intelligent to fail this test. We go, and she always remarked the test and said, oh, I'm sorry, Miss Avopoku, um, you know, you passed. That was my fault. And I thought, great, because I knew, you know, I had the confidence that, you know, I had studied, you know, and, and credit to Uncle George, if he's listening, that I had been taught very well when it comes to mathematics. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> and um, you know, I had even done, you know, at sixth form, I'd done additional maths. So I studied science at sixth form, for those who don't know, you know, I studied science and I'd done additional maths. So I didn't have, wasn't something that me, you know, was, it was anything difficult. So my journey started from there, you know, um, you know, a lady called Catherine Risk, she took an interest in me when she had an opportunity to get into HR as a personnel manager. She took me in with her, and my plan at the time was to try and understand how the business operates, you know, a family business operates, and then hopefully I can then, you know, rise through the ranks and get to the head office and do governance because, you know, I had, you know, I was, you know, I was studying for my master's in governance at the time. Unfortunately, I got, you know, I got into HR. I was very great, you know, I'm very good with people and all that but never got the opportunity to go into the head office because the opportunity simply weren't there. You know, everybody wanted to employ someone who had experience in governance, and I didn't have the experience um, in governance. I've been helping my family to run their own family business, and my motivation for going to Sainsbury's was to actually see how other people run their family businesses and also to learn a bit more and take it more to the corporate level and understand a lot more around the governance, around running family businesses. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, didn't quite make it to head office that same So I had an opportunity to work uh, for the central offices of the Methodist Church, and I thought, great, my great grandfather was a Methodist minister. So you know, what more could I ask for? And there was a governance project that I was asked to come and lead on for two years because at the time they were an accepted charity, so basically they didn't have to report to the charity commission. However, they had to ensure that, you know, with the changes in charity law, they had to then prepare to um, report into the charity commission. So I went in there to do that piece of work for them on a contract. And, you know, I took a pay cut. It was a very junior role, you know, from being a personnel manager because at Sainsbury's I then rose through the ranks and became a personnel manager. But I was determined really to do what I really wanted to do, which is governance, because, you know, I'm kind of like that problem solving person who understands how all the systems work together and, you know, try and solve a problem when nobody can crack it. So. Nothing was going to stand in the way of me, you know, trying to achieve that. So anyway, I took that um, Methodist Church role, did it for two years. At the end of the contract, they wanted to keep me on. I said no, you know, um, because obviously I had my eye on other things that I wanted to do. And, you know, I did various things in between, you know, running my own business, you know, trying to do a few businesses outside of that whilst looking for the opportunity. So... My agent actually introduced this current opportunity that I have here you know, to me. And honestly, the beauty of it is I didn't even know who I was going to work for because you don't get told, you know. So then you come wow. into a role that you don't get told. So, you know, and for me, it was purely my knowledge, you know. So I went in there and until I arrived, that's when I realized that I was actually in, you know, where I was. I was in the palace and, you know. I've, I've been brought in to come and look mm -hmm. at government wow. systems and help manage reputational oh. risk. So, oh, Yvonne, Yvonne, your phone is um, the the um, your reception is breaking up a bit. Okay. Yeah, the reception is breaking yeah. up. Let me... Yeah. That's better. So, how how was the feeling like when you found out that you know you're going to be working for Prince Charles? I know, I don't know, but up to this day, it still doesn't face me. I just feel like you know, I'm going to work, <laughs> you know, and, and I know that, 
you know, and, and I think the beauty of it is they like the attitude about me because I haven't got royal red carpet fever, okay? So I mm. come in to do a job and to do a very good job and to say it as it is because my allegiance obviously is to the organizations that I work with, but also as a professional governance professional, I have signed up to a code of ethics and conduct so I go into a job bound by ethics and conduct. So I go in and do a good job. So whether it's, you know, a member of the royal family or it's Joe Blocks, you know, who has set up his own company and wants me to help them, I come in and do a very professional job, which is, you know, bound, bound to the standards. So, you know, after a three-stage interview process, you know, where I have to talk about what good really governance really would look like. Was it really, really difficult? Know, the three stages? You know, I, well, it depends on how you look at it. I don't think that it was difficult. And this is what I always say. When you're, when you're good at what you do and you've been asked to come and speak yeah. because, you know, you've got the knowledge, you know, you go in and you present confidently, which is what I did, you know, but obviously I prepared for it, you know. I, you know, I went in there and really, and I think they really understood that, you know, I understood governance and I had a clear mm -hmm. plan of what I wanted to do in terms of, you know, the, the, the problem that I was presented with, you know, what I wanted to do to, to ensure good governance, you know, is, is, is reflected in at the time, the 21 organizations that were linked to, you know, um, the Prince of Wales. So, you know, did that interview, waited, and then was told, yeah, mm -hmm. that, you know, the role is yours, come in and fix things for us, basically. And I've been doing that for, you know, I've been supporting those companies for over 10 years now. How many years? Sorry, it broke up. Yeah. How many years now? Just over 10 years. Over 10 years. Yeah. And did you ever, from the, from the Ghanaian community or from the African community, did anybody say to you, Yvonne, please, I want to meet Prince Charles. Can you hook us up, please? Oh, I do get that a lot. <laughs> You know, I, you know I, do, I do get that a lot, but then what I always do is if there are opportunities, you know, um, for for the Kenyan community to, to come to an event. So, for example, the event that we met at, I get involved, you know, I got involved in looking at the guest list and making sure that the right people are invited. Prior to that event, there was another one for British West Africans. And again, I was involved in that event. So I make sure that, you know, you know, people that I think are quite, you know, doing good job in our community and haven't got too much, you know, royal red carpet fever can actually come along, you know, to these to these events. Yeah. Fantastic. So what are the uh, what are some of the core tasks as a chartered governance professional? It's, it's a broad range, you know, a broad range of activities, but the core and the core of it is um, regulatory and legal compliance um, of the entities that, you know, that you're responsible for. So, you know, in the portfolio of companies that I look after, you know, there are commercial companies, there are not-for-profit companies, and, you know, some of the things that apply to the commercial companies might not apply to the not-for-profits. But I always say I raise my standards high. So even for the not-for-profits, I set up the standards quite high that whatever I put in place for the commercial companies, I put that in place for not-for-profit. Because what we've seen over the years is whereas um, a while ago, not-for-profits were down here and governance-wise down here and um, commercial companies were up there, now the not for profits are moving up in line. So there is a corporate governance code. There is now a charity governance code, you know, and it's all, you know, there are quite a lot of similarities in that. So I always say that as a governance professional, you never go wrong if you use the commercial standards, you know, to help bring the not for profit companies in line. Because in five years time, they will all, I think they'll be on par, you know, being asked to achieve the same things. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and what made you start, you know, your own um, network, should I say? You know, why did you feel the need um, to set up your own your own company? Yeah, so I, in, in my current role in support of um, um, the Royal Highness, His Royal Highness, 
I come across, I also manage a fund, charitable funds, and I come across a lot of small charities or not-for-profit organizations that are really doing good work. But then what I find is that the governance standards are really, you know, non-existent or quite weak. So I thought, what is the best way that I can support, you know, um, these small not-for-profits other than giving them feedback when they've put in an application? And I decided to set up Heartfelt Philanthropy Network, really, to enhance, to help small organizations, you know, enhance the governance standards, but also to... Um, look at capacity building, you know, to make sure that they've got the right structures in place, um, to make sure that they're fit for purpose, to make sure that they can compete on the same, you know, uh, level playing field with, with the bigger, with the much bigger organizations that have stronger brands, you know, behind them. And really also to connect these organizations to philanthropists who usually might not support them because they're kind of not sure whether they're doing the right thing. So I hope that my, you know, my presence in, in, in my involvement in those organizations will then give those philanthropists the assurance that actually the charity, those organizations have really got a lot of passion and they've got me supporting them, you know, to do the right thing. So it's really like creating that confidence as well. And if at all, you know, to manage those charitable funds on behalf of the philanthropists, if they feel that that is what would make them more comfortable to support these um, small organisations. Absolutely. And I think what you're doing is, is really important because you have so much experience, so much wealth of knowledge and, you know, you're giving back basically to the community um, with what you've learned. And I think... You know, even with us as a Guba Foundation, we have benefited so much with the short period that we, you know, you've come into um, our, our foundation to, you know, to structure us and make sure that we are doing things the right way. Um, and even the way our communication comes out, everything, um, though, everything is about governance and, and how you even going to trust another um, entity to invest in you if you are not doing the right thing, you know, because they do all their checks and, you know, from doing, you know, um, this fundraising thing, that's when I, I saw that actually there's a lot of things that we don't do right, that we don't know um, until, you know, um, somebody comes along and, and, and is requesting information. And then you're like, oh, I don't have this, or, you know, you need to quickly um, scrubble and get that. So I think um, obviously governance plays a huge part in everything that we're doing, um, but we're gonna delve into that a bit more, but I'm gonna introduce my next guest. So I'm just going to um, um, put you um, back into the waiting room and interview and, and bring on board Pal Grave, who's our next guest on the show, and I'll bring you back. Okay. That was Yvonne talking about governors because about what she does and her role um, that she plays. I mean, she's the trustee of the Google Foundation, doing an amazing job for us. Um, and next up, I'm going to introduce. Um, our brother, our brother Paul Graves. Uh, Paul Graves is a startup re engineering policy consultant, researcher, lecturer, um, and missionary. Um, he has 18 years of work experience, has exposed him to four continents of the world Africa, the Middle East, Europe, and Asia, and he has been involved in more than 78 countries. Prior to Calgary joining corporate government, he was part of the team that led Day Life Africa in Ghana. He's trained over 500,000 young people across four continents. I mean, <sighs> equipped with over, was it 3,000 churches and worked with almost 300 rural and urban communities. Um, he's an amazing person. He is the immediate past head of the programs at the Dankwa Institute and now the funding executive director at the Kandifu Institute, a policy research think tank that focuses on leadership, economy, and governance. So, huh, we want to hear what our brother has to say. And I'm sure he has a lot to say. And, you know, Come on, he's trained over 500,000. I was happy to tell you, I didn't say 500,000 young people in leadership government. And this is, this is what we need as a community. This is what we need. And, it, you know, for me, I'm so privileged to have 
having on the show today to inspire us and impact us. For me, the show, we need to have some music. We need to look at what we need to do as a younger generation that are coming up so that we can do things with that again. So please welcome Paul Wave. Hi, Paul. Hi, Danta. Good evening. How are you? Good evening. I am very well, thank you. And how are you as well? I'm good. Thank you so much for joining us on tonight's show. Um, I mean, reading about you, I'm just like, I'm so inspired. Um, and I want you to kind of, again, you know, start from the top, how you got into doing what you do currently. Okay. Thank you so much, Denta. And so um, I think that I've had a bit of an amazing journey. Um, when, when I was done with my tertiary studies at the University of Ghana, I had a divine interruption. And uh, I like to refer to it as such, that the Lord called me into ministry and I uh, had an opportunity to serve as a missionary for 20 years. And I worked in 78 countries and during that time, trained close to about 500,000 young people to say that we train young people to be able to build healthy disciple making youth movement in their independent local churches. And I studied Jesus's life very clearly. Um, I lived on site in Israel um, for three and a half years um, to be able to understand clearly what Jesus went through and leave out that ministry as we did the training. And um, as it is, as um, the Lord gave us opportunity in terms of further studies, I came to London to study as well at Spurgeon's College for a master's in advanced Christian studies. And I had opportunity to come back home to Ghana where I served as the head of programs at the Dankwa Institute and primarily also a think tank that is very- Who's your father, great. right? Uh, well, Dr. J.B. Dankwa is my great grandfather. Yes, um, Dr. Okay. J.B. Dankwa, the doyan of Ghana politics, uh, yeah. who was part of the best six and fought for the liberation yes. and the independence of this country, Ghana, for which we are all proud. Mm. So I, 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 I entered into um, governance and think tank within that platform and environment where I served for one year, where we had a number of policy conversations, a number of researches, and worked very closely with government. And along the journey, I had opportunity to pioneer my think tank, which is Candifo Institute. Um, it's just 12 weeks away from becoming one year. And um, our main mandate is to train leaders of leaders for people to understand what it means to be a leader, because we believe that leaders are not born, but leaders are made. And um, over the year, over the months that we've started Candifo Institute, we've trained close to about 1,800 young people across um, 10 different universities. Wow. And um, 1,800 is 1,800. So what, so what, that what, 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 perspective. Yeah, the scope what, of the training. Yeah, the scope what, of what the training. Yeah. yeah. No, sorry, go ahead. No, I wanted to ask that. You're, you're, you're okay. about to answer it. So I was gonna okay. ask I forget. I forget that you wanted to ask the scope of the training. So our scope of training, <laughs> our scope, our scope of training, um, it, it, if we look at leadership, we first began with getting young people to understand what it means to build a team. And um, we developed a model that looks into team building divided into a disk analysis that goes beyond temperament. And so we look at a high D, which is someone who is a dominant factor, someone who is a driver, someone who is a determiner. And then we look at a high I, someone who is an influencer, someone who is an inspirer. And we look at a high S, someone who is steady, and steady is spelled S-T-E-A-D-Y. And then we look at a high C, someone who is consensual. And um, we do this training for people to understand that regardless of your temperamental state, either being a phlegmatic, choleric, melancholic, or sanguine, you, when you are placed in a particular environment, you can you can act as a high D, or you can act as an II, or a high S, or a high C, and um, that's more on a working environment. And um, as as a fellow of John Maxwell, I also pick up a few training material from John Maxwell that we used to encourage the young people. We did a 360 degree training where we had close to about 800 young people participating simultaneously at the same time. So um, that's what we've been doing, Candifo Institute. We have about 10 initiatives underneath an institute. 
We believe very strongly in leadership. We believe very strongly in the economy. We believe very strongly in, in governance. So we have three initiatives called the Economy Hive, Leadership Hive, and the Governance Hive. We also have an initiative called the Mentoring and Coaching Hub because we believe that um, when people are trained, people need to be coached and people need to be mentored. I yeah. over, over the week, I was reading a research paper that was written by one um, Professor Kosiba, and he reiterates very strongly that for Ghana to be able to get to the stage in which we have to get to, we need leaders that are trained and leaders that are equipped and leaders that are mentored. And so it's two different things, going through a leadership class and going through a leadership school and it's another thing going through a process of coaching and a process of mentoring. What does that is that it gives you a process of implementation. So you are clearly able to implement and put into practice the things that you are taught in real time. And so we have a coaching and a mentoring hub. We also have an Abatio Asumbie hub um, where every electioneering year we encourage young people to pledge for peace. Um, the advent of no peace is it's chaos and crisis and civil war. And I'm not sure that anybody would want to toy with civil war or toy with a lack of peace. Having worked in a number of countries where some of them were high war zone countries, um, Liberia would be one example. Liberia's population, two thirds of Liberia's population are young people because most of the elderly people that were involved in the civil war lost their lives. And so clearly um, we look into those things. We also have an initiative was the Democratic Election Think Tank Center. We turn our think tank every electionary year to be able to clearly focus on how young people can understand what it means as they are making decisions for people who would lead the country either as presidential or parliamentary. And so I, I always make the story and state that I'm not sure I recall why I voted for political party A at a time when I turned 18, but I'm sure I was reminded of a few things that informed my decision. We want to be able to encourage the young people to make decisions that would influence their own future. So we set up a democratic election think tank center that every electionary year, young people can be able to clearly understand why they do what they do. We also have an initiative called Let Her Lead. And um, it's just uh, very exciting to see that Denta has a show because we believe in women in leadership. But um, this, this, I need to state it very clearly in context that um, when the leaders, when the female leaders come on the table to lead, they come on the table to lead not because of their gender. They come on the table to lead clearly because of their skills. And I yeah. think that uh, that needs okay. to be hammered on very clearly. So we have a number of young people who are just going around advocating for women empowerment and feminism. And often when you give these women opportunities, they do not have the skill. And I am advocating that we need a conversation before our young people are misled that the women that you look up to, um, like the dentists and um, the various professors that we find across board, these women have the skill and it is as a result of their skill. It's not because of their gender. And so we have an initiative called Let Her Lead, which is a conversation that goes beyond feminism, conversation that clearly goes beyond women empowerment. And then we have an initiative, final initiative called Let's Go Lower. This initiative clearly is a conversation where we, yes, a conversation where we start having conversation with younger people from the ages of 13. So young people who are 13 years old should clearly understand what governance is. Young people who are 13 years old understand what the economy is. Young people who are 13 years old upwards understand what um, governance is. And so we clearly train these young people to understand that when we talk about leadership, this is what it means. When we talk about governance, this is what it means. When we talk about the economy, this is what it means. When a budget is read for a year, this is the implication of that and on and on and on. We, we have just had the privilege of being licensed as an award operating center for the Duke of Edinburgh International Award Scheme, um, which happened in March. And so um, the president, Nanado Danko Ekufuado, who is the president of the Republic of Ghana, is the patron for the head of state award scheme in Ghana. And he's put up a mandate that young people be trained and equipped, 500,000 young people be trained and equipped over the period of five years. And so Kandifo Institute has been licensed as an award operator. And beginning from next month, we are going to roll out a 
a scheme where young people between the ages of 13 to 24 will be put into an award schedule. Those that are 13 years old will go through a six month volunteering work in any field that they choose. Those that are 15 and above will go through um, a 12 month volunteering work in any field that they choose. And those that are 16, 17 and above will go through an 18 month volunteering work in any field that they choose. And so Kanifu Institute is inspired by these things. And we work very closely with local workers. We work with the youth employment agency where we are assisting very clearly with their job center to enable people understand what soft skills are like. And so um, clearly uh, my board, my board Kanifu Institute is, um, I serve as the executive director of the Institute. My board is chaired by Nana Dr. Nakaoswa the first. He is the president for the Chamber of Commerce and Industry and uh, a few other people that serve on my board. Fantastic. It looks like you've been busy, how brave. I mean, with all these amazing initiatives, um, I'm glad you're even having time for, for us to speak and share, um, you know, everything that you're doing. Um, what do you think is the difference between governance and leadership? So thank you. Um, in, in governance is leadership. And so I need to, I need to put in that in governance is, in, is leadership, but I would like to give a definition for leadership. Leadership for me, clearly for however you want to explain it, leadership is who a person is to you. So if you, if you look at um, many people will say that um, um, everything rises and falls on a leader. Um, you want to be able to put in adjectives in terms of definition of a leader, but leadership is really what you see. What you see in people, defines who the person is in terms of the person's leadership. But leadership as well is the ability to lead. Leadership is the ability to lead and leadership is the ability to have followers. And so if, if you're a leader and you do not have followers, then who are you leading? But clearly, mm. if, if you want to put a one size definition for leadership, leadership is one who has a vision that creates a vision that aligns people to that particular vision, that drives the people to that vision, and is able to live in his lifetime to see that that vision is actualized. Yes. And there uh, are various examples that you can put into place. On the continent of Africa, you can put a, a man like Nelson Mandela. And if you want to understand, you will say that Nelson Mandela decided that we needed to have equal rights. And so he fought against apartheid where there were classes, Africans and um, black South Africans. And it, it, he fought for this to the extent that he went into prison. And when he came out of prison and he realized that this was achieved, he handed over his first term to Tabo Ibeki. And so he did only four terms and handed over to Tabo Ibeki to continue it. So for him as a leader, he had created that vision, he had seen that vision and he has seen it actualized. And in his lifetime, we realized that he lived up to it. So that for me is leadership. What is governance? Governance clearly is like um, driving a vehicle. If you are a driver, you direct the vehicle where to go. That's governance for me. It's the steering of the affairs of an institute or an organization or a country or a family or a setup. That is governance. So governance is... Um, a governance is bringing all of that into, into, into one point and making sure that you are achieving that set goal. That is why I say that in leadership is governance because you can't govern adequately if you are not a leader and you can't lead adequately if you are not governed very well because um, leadership has boundaries. And so the two are interchangeable, but you cannot exchange the two as well. Wow. Wow, fantastic. I mean, hey, this topic, I'm getting excited because we're going to learn a lot today. For you guys that are watching, make sure that you are sharing your pages because you don't want to miss out on this knowledge. It's too good to just have it all to yourself. They say uh, sharing is caring. So make sure that you share your pages, um, that you get other people to watch and for them to be inspired. We want to make sure that the next generation are fully equipped to be leaders and to have good governance and to have people around them that will, you know, inspire them. Like um, Palgrave said that it's so important for us to have good mentors, 
people that can lead us and make sure that what we are doing, we are doing it the correct way. So Palgrave, I'm gonna put you backstage and I'm gonna um, bring on our next guest, um, Martin Williams or Furi Atta. So um, Palgrave, I'm just gonna put you back Thank and you. then we'll continue yeah. and I'm gonna bring you all back on and then we'll dive into the topic. Thank you. please make sure that um, you share your pages. If you're not already subscribing or following, make sure that if you're on Facebook, you share your page and you click the like button. Um, if you are watching us on YouTube, make sure you click the subscribe button. Um, like I said, I'm gonna in now introduce um, our brother uh, from another mother. Um, funny enough, you know, when I was um, checking my emails, um, I know Martin is watching. I found an email from Martin in 2013. So I was in communication with Martin, um, not knowing he's the Martin that I'm going to be interviewing today. <laughs> um, I found a proposal that he had sent to me or we were discussing and I was like, wow. Um, and I actually sent him the email address. I was like, Martin, is this your email address? And he's like, oh my goodness. Then so I stopped using that email address like years ago. Um, but anyway, uh, Martin is a highly accomplished cybersecurity um, with over 13 years track record in information security and program management. Martin has a strong track record in development and delivery of IT strategy, information security, risk management and program delivery. Uh, Martin has successfully deployed complex technical cybersecurity solutions for large corporate organizations, including Vodafone, Rolls-Royce, AP Muller, uh, Centro West Midlands and the NHS. I mean, what, why is Martin still in the UK, please? We need his skills in Ghana. I mean, all of these things that I'm reading out here, I'm like, no, we need Martin in Ghana. And I know Palgrave, after, after this conversation, you're going to get uh, your friend and say Martin back to the motherland so that he can, you know, he can help out because I think we need some of these skills um, back home in, in Ghana. Um, so without further ado, and he's he does a lot more, but I'm going to get him to say a bit more about what he's currently doing. So please welcome Martin Oforiata. Hi, Martin. Hello, Denta. <laughs> Martin, do you remember our, uh, that email that you sent me in 2013? Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I was looking at it and I said, like, oh my goodness, that's ages ago, you know. That was hey. when I was nominated for the Guba Awards, you know. So. Yeah. My goodness, it's been yeah. it's been such a long time. But yeah. you know, you have a, a, a background which is highly rooted in very complex IT systems, cybersecurity, and so on. How did you come into that? You know, how how did you start into you know doing that? Well, um, then I came into this I came to this country, UK here, with just 40 pounds in my pocket, nothing, no, no support whatsoever. And uh, wow. I was I was just determined, you know, because where I'm where I was coming from, there was no <laughs> there was nothing, you know, to go back to. So it was like wow. uh, life and death for me. So I was just determined. So when I got into this country, I I I just began to um, do whatever. What I age? Said. What age? What, what age were you when you when you uh, came when, to the UK? What, at the age I was I was about 24, 25 years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. so I then I was really determined to to make it, you know. So and I I'm very very passionate about IT stuff. You know, way back in Ghana, although I did a bit of um, teaching courses here and then. I was a professional teacher in Ghana, but when I had a breakthrough to come to the UK, I decided to go for you know the best, you know. So get to where I wanted to get to, although I'm not there yet, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so forty pounds in my. Uh, you're my, there. You're there. You've done a lot. You've you worked with a lot of major companies. You're there. Yeah. <laughs> so with the forty pounds, I just decided, you know, um, I was going to go to university, um, do my all the courses that I wanted to do. Um, I enrolled with um, uh, Staffordshire University, 
did my, you know, uh, all the, I wanted professional courses. I wanted just to, to come out with skills. I didn't want to go and do this, all this degree. And then you come out and you don't know what you're doing. You can't so do nothing I, with it. Yeah. Exactly. So I did. And at that time, uh, I remember, um, Staffordshire University were offering all those courses as part of their, you know, degree courses. So I went in and I just did everything. I did Microsoft, I did Cisco. And then when, when, when I came out, um, it was really tough getting me get, getting a job. So I I went into order picking. You know, I was I I was so determined to make it. So I just went for anything. You know, to pay the bills. Mm. So I was working at a warehouse. At the same time, I was I was looking for uh, a job. You know, the career that I wanted to get into, which is uh, the IT. Um, and then just a, a year afterwards, I, I had my breakthrough. You know, I had a job with a small company and they, they gave me the opportunity to be a Cisco engineer. Um, and then I, I was also very... So what, what a Cisco engineer? You have to explain it to us for those that we don't so understand. The technology. Like more to do with the networking of science, networking of computers, networking of systems, you know. So, okay. and I had done a course and, and I was really, really, you know, uh, into that. And, and I was a, more or less a specialist uh, in that area. And so it was more to do with the networking of computers, networking of systems. So I was employed to do uh, more to do with coming up with the design of networks and how each department will connect with a, 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 the other department across, you know, uh, across the sites. So that's what that was what I was meant to do. And I did it really well. And at the same time, I was really, really ambitious then. And I'm still ambitious because I, I'm still ambitious. So I, I wanted to start set up a business as well. Okay. Um, so, I, so I did set a business up, um, and within a couple of few years, I mean, it just about two, three years, I was standing over about, over, 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 over about quarter of a million pounds uh, for, wow. for that business. Yeah. Uh, because I mean, I had a lot of, um, investors, you know, people, corporate organizations <laughs> who, wow. who, yeah, who were really, uh, interested in what I was doing. Um, what, what was it? What were you doing so that we can take note, please? So it was more to do with the IT stuff, like the IT things okay. that I was, I was doing. So I set up a company to specially um, uh, support other businesses, small businesses at that time, SMEs, you know. Yeah. So uh, because there was a gap on the market at that time. That was between 2004, 2006. And that, that was a gap, you know, so I, 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 I smelled it. I, I, I did smell the opportunity. Uh, mm. and then, uh, I went into it and then ba basically it started to, you know, grow. Um, and, and within the two years, you know, two to three years, I was standing that uh, uh, about, about 250. Wow. Do you think, um, Martin, do you think sometimes, not to cut you, do you think sometimes we, 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 we miss opportunities? That sometimes we don't we don't see, you know. You said that you could smell an opportunity. Yeah. Do you yeah. think sometimes that it's there? We can smell it, but we just don't know how to to grab it. Exactly, exactly. And, and the thing is, more to do with our background as well. You know, we people come here with the immigrant mentality. I was, uh, for me, I was, I was, that, I was that kind of um, that fearless. You know, should I that, should I put it? That way, I was fearless. I was a do and die person. At that time, mm. like I didn't really care about what people think about me, what the fear that people will come up with, and the, the sort of uh, skeptics that they were. I, I wasn't. Mm. I wasn't buying to it. So, I mean, it is there. People, the opportunity is there. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, a lot of people like us, you know, who are coming from, uh, let's say, Africa and wherever, they have that kind of fear. They come with the mm. immigrant mentality, and that put put them in a box, you know. Mm. And so, so for me, between two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight, my the business was really going, was doing well, and 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 the uh, financial crisis came, you know, between two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, and that's yeah, yeah, that's, when, that. yeah, that's when all IT business when it crunched, <laughs> when it yes, crunched. and it really hit all the uh, all the big IT, the big IT firms. Mm. And so that actually had a knock-on effect on my business. And then so I said, okay, if that's the case, I'm going to go into consultancy 
because at that time I have had you know the experience I've had uh, the dealings with businesses supported them and I have I've had references I could get references and so straight away I've got a contract with um, Chorus um, Chorus a big company um, again they, they, they offer me a contract to be their network um, architect so more or less they never uh, like supervising um supervising all their network they were actually implementing wireless 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 um uh, uh network and i was the one that was put in charge mm -hmm. to oversee the implementation of the yeah. wireless network for chorus for over 48 branches and i did that within 12 months and then wow. yeah and yes and so that's where my wow. consultant career began you know and then from there i've worked for the likes of um you know um rose royce as well rose royce also came headhunted me and i was also to build the cyber security portfolio and uh i did it uh, you was headhunted yes I, they were looking for you oh yes basically yeah yeah i was headhunted for somebody that came to the uk with just yeah. 40 pounds yeah with 40 you pounds. came you were so determined yeah, you went to university, you did yeah. your course, and yeah. you were just like, I'm going to make it. Like you said, do or die. You just yes, went no. all out. Exactly. A few yeah. years later, now you have companies mm -hmm. that are were chasing for you mm -hmm. to be yeah. on, their, on their team, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, that's something that, you know, young people, everybody that's watching, guys, you can come with five pounds. You can come with 10 pounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can have no money. And, um, and and get money you know exactly. it depends like i was saying to that's all like i was saying at the beginning it depends on how determined you are how passionate you are you know determination is is is, is a big part of us and how fearless you use the word fearless yeah martin said he was fearless yeah sometimes we have too much fear in things that we are doing and it's just is is blocking us mm -hmm yeah and you know and, and I, I i want you to really encourage people that are watching about you know how you know how to be determined how to not be fearless you know and sometimes i know that you know we get scared we're human but how do we overcome the the fear well the thing is i, I mean in the uk contest i, I would say our our answer using the uk contest okay the thing yeah. is here in this country we've got so many things you know um where we've got the rules we've got a lot of rules and we've got a lot of um you know should i say barriers you know to break mm -hmm. and so when you come into this country you've got to have the mindset that like what what you need what you want to achieve is not what people want you to achieve or what people want you to be mm -hmm. and so a lot mm -hmm. of people come with the mindset like coming to ask people the best area to go into that is a four start okay you have to come with the vision of what you want to do the things that mm -hmm. you want to achieve and so and then you do your own research because because how to be fearless in this country is the is 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 based on how far you want to go how how you want to go and the fact of the matter is people are going to come up with excuses and 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 a lot of immigrants have the excuses ment mentality and, and the fact of the matter is when you don't have excuses you 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 tend to do things based on the instincts your instincts you know so what your instincts are telling you you go for it and and then come what may you're gonna break through you know the fight the, the thing is once you go for it you're gonna go, you're going to get it in this country you're going to succeed and so to answer your question to have that fearless mentality you just have to have a vision you need to decide what you want to do and not not be, be basing on what others are telling you and not be basing on you know mm. what uh, the the rules are saying because the rules are there but you just have to know what you can do to meet the standards or to meet the rules. It's not for the rules to box you in, but if for you, so for instance, um, I mean, a, a typical example is when I started my business, people were telling me um, because mm -hmm. of the color of my skin or because of my accent, uh, which was a, a more mm -hmm. or less 
uh, you know, an invisible rule, I couldn't get a loan. Mm. I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I couldn't get a loan, or I couldn't get a grant, or I wouldn't be able to get secure any kind of, you know, help from anywhere. But I, I did my mm. own research, and I realized, I you know, listen, if you if you go here and you actually actually present your case and you do it as the way they want it, you know, and mm. you go uh, be beyond that expectation, even if they set, they've set an expectation, make sure you are going beyond, you are doing more, then they will listen to you. Because I, I did I did my trial and error, and, and I found out that what they were telling me was not actually the, the case. And and so it came about from, I came about as a result of what me doing it myself and finding out the truth for myself. And based on that, I was able to get the results that I, I needed, you know, and, 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 and also, um, I mean, I should say my wife also did a lot, you know, by encouraging me. She she was also one of, she was my rock at that time, you know. So I did breakthrough based on the support that I, I had from her as well. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, we've got a, a question up. I mean, I'm going to bring the guest up, but we've got a question from um, Romeo and he says, Martin, what kind of relationship did you have that influenced you in your journey to being successful? So what's the, what kind of relationship did you have that influenced you in your journey? So my relationship, you see, the relationship that you build, I know it's about governance and, and leadership. So as a leader, and you see, or as an entrepreneur, you have to have a leader, a leader, a leader's mindset. For me, a leader is some somebody who is what revolutionary. And if you want to be revolutionary, you have to have a good interpersonal skills. I mean, you've got to have the networking skills. So the kind of relationship that I developed was to have a networking skills, uh, the net, developing the networking skills in order for me to reach out to the people that I wanted to uh, to uh, get the help from. So, so in a nutshell, what you need to do is to actually have that kind of networking skills, have to be, be able to build relationship. You, have, you should be able to build bridges. Uh, if, you, if you really want to be successful, you don't fold your arms and you wait for things to fall on your lap. No, you go for it. And the, the way you, you get it, the only means, uh, uh, the, the, the only way that you are going to get it is that you develop the relationship with the people that will help you, or the people that you need help from, yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I think this is, is now time to bring on all of my guests. So let me bring back Paul Grave. Let me bring back Yvonne. Welcome, um, I welcome you all back um, onto the show. And this is when we're gonna really delve into the topic. Um, but before I do that, actually, Martin, tell us a bit about the book you are working on about democracy. Um, is democracy our solution? Yes. So, so I'm writing this book, and hopefully it should be out by the end of the year. So I, I, I have done my research, and I'm still doing the research, and this is why this is why the book is going to come out. I have done the research, and I found out that listen, um, Africa, we 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 are not meant to. Um, we are not meant to use democracy as our governance and the way the way we govern ourselves uh, okay um because why because democracy is foreign to africa believe it or not i know people will argue with me but the fact of the matter is before uh the the likes of britain the colonial uh, the colonial powers came into africa what were uh, what were the African countries or what, what were they doing? The African countries, what were they doing? They were ruling themselves. They, they, had, they were rich. If you go into the kind of the, uh, the, the all the kingdoms, we have the Malian Empire, we have the Songa Empire, we have the Ashanti Kingdom. How, you just ask, ask yourself, how were they ruling them? They were very rich and powerful. And the, the people were self-sufficient. And I was, for me, I was... I was raised up in a village, right, uh, right from, you know, in the village in Ghana, I'm not going to mention, where we had our king, and, and the king cared for the people, you know, they had, they, they had a heart for the people, and so they 
their, their form of rule was for the people and to actually better the people's lives. Now, democracy, I'm coming to democracy. Democracy is for Europeans. Okay, listen, yeah. If democracy is for Europeans, government of the people, by the people and of the people. Fair enough. Ask yourself, you have three, uh, leg the legislature, the judiciary, the executive. Are they independent? Are they really independent? Uh, do we have our institutions are strong enough to actually uh, uh, have that kind of democratic rule? Our, 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 our institutions are not strong enough. You know, so, so we have one party winning and all they do is uh, the winners take it all, they take it all, yeah? Is that the winner take it all? And that's, that, that's what has been going for, on for years. And Africa is now riddled with poverty. People come into power, they always come in uh, giving the promises because that's what democratic, uh, if, you, if you want to have a democratic rule, the party, you have to have a political party and, and the, the, the political parties form factions. And when they come, they have to have their manifesto. And so a lot of them are built on what promises and the promises, a lot of them are built on what things that they cannot accomplish. So when they come, they know they will not be able to accomplish it. So they can, they do what they, all they can to get all they want for themselves and their family and uh, to the detriment of the people. And I'm not talking just about Ghana. You, talk, you just look at across Africa the likes of Congo. Congo should be one of the richest in the world. We should have Nigeria as one of the richest of the world. But these are countries that are boxed in by the foreign powers. And, and, and the reason why I'm saying is this democratic rule is being manipulated by the powers that be. Uh, so in, in other words, they are saying, if you don't do this, we don't give you this. You know? mm. So at the end of the day, we are always at their beck and call. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about the European superpowers who don't have our business at heart. They don't have our interests at heart. So, so, so this book is going to delve deep. And, and I'm not saying we should get rid of it entirely, but there wow. should be modification. There should be some modification. You go to Israel, they have a president and they have a prime minister. Okay? They have a development plan. And I'm, I'm telling you, Israel has been in existence since 1940, 1940. And I'm telling you, you, you cannot compare Israel to Ghana. Even China, China in the late 70s, they were nowhere near, you know, uh, the likes of India. But where, where is China now? So, so it tells you mm. the democracy that we are talking about and going on and where we're going on about is, 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 is not doing us any good. It's not doing anything. We need mm. to look into it, you know, because like, what I'm saying is you can't give birth to a Jew in Israel and introduce the culture of an African to that Jew in Israel. They will kick you out. They will kick you out. It is, that's what we're doing here. We are all Africans. We need to identify our with our culture. Our culture has had the kingdom rule. If, if, if that is not going to be... Or, or, or uh, definitely we have excesses, yeah. But then we, when we modify it, we can have a system that take the people's interest uh, as the priority here. So if even you have a development plan, we can see that no matter who comes in, no matter who goes out, there is a development plan. Twenty years. This is where we want to get to, and and the likes of Israel. That's what they are doing. If you if you are going to vote for you, come and do what the president or everything that has been documented, that's what they want. They have a progress plan, you know, so that's what we, we are missing. Mm -hmm. We are missing. So, Paul Grave, what form of yes. governance do you think we ought to embrace as Africans? Participatory, participatory governance for me would be one that um, we need to embrace. So what does participatory governance mean? I think that um, the advent of COVID-19 has um, given everyone an opportunity to take into consideration the various stakeholders that come into play when you are governing a country or even governing a particular sector of the country. And um, for me, as we look at governance and we look at democracy, I would strongly advocate for participatory, all-inclusive, all involving 
um, you know, the mind is not a repository of knowledge. And so when you're able to gather a buffet of minds together, um, regardless of where the person comes from in terms of political ideology, then you are looking into the development of the country. I, I would just want to bring um, into play um, some of the things that Martin shared. And I, I, I listened very keenly and observed his passion. And I commend him for wanting to contribute to academia with his book. And I look forward to it. And I, I look forward to reading it. Um, I, I just want to reference a few things that um, much as our, our continent is a very young continent. And um, sometimes it's important we put we put it in perspective, um, so that we would appreciate the journeys that we have been on. And so clearly, if you look at Ghana, um, which is situated where I am and where I live and where I work, um, since 1957, Ghana has had close to about 17 to 18 leaders, and um, we have had 17 to 18 leaders in 63 years. Uh, which is too much to have and also too young as a country to have gone through. But last year, I did a research that brought very strongly the various leadership styles that we have had amongst the various 17 to 18 leaders. And I'm glad Yvonne is here because we started our, our leadership from a monarchical rule where Queen Elizabeth ruled Ghana from 1957 to 1960. And this was when we had even had independence. So when we had independence, Queen Elizabeth led the country for three years before Kwame Nkrumah came in into the Republic from 1960 and onwards and onwards. I, I, I divided the country into the various sectors. And so for me, as, as a younger person who lives in the country, I have an, an appreciation of our democracy and um, I, I, I'm sure I will contribute some few things to Martin's work, which he's going to put out. That if you look at the dispensation of the country that says that we are 63 years, those 63 years, it's not, we can't say that we've been democratically developed in the 63 years, because I can clearly state that out of the 63 years, our development has been close to about 28 years, because Queen Elizabeth took a monarchical rule of three years, then we went into a republic rule, and then we went through a military regime, and then we started the democracy from 1992. Yeah. And so we can strongly say that Ghana, in terms of um, birth, is not 63 years, because we are still a developing country. So I would say that Ghana is just two decades and a few years old. When we put it that Ghana is two decades and a few years old, then we need to now start the conversation. How do we now put our country on a pedestal of growth? And so last week, I, I, I talked through a process of a developmental agenda as Ghana prepares to celebrate 100 years in the next 37 years. So in the next 37 years, Ghana is going to be 100 years. And I am very sure that all the people around this table, Dente, Martin, Yvonne, and myself, and the rest of the people that are watching us, are going to be at the helm of affairs in terms of very influential roles when we are 100 years old. How do we start that conversation from now? What kind of country do we want to see? Because I mean, the, we, we raised the various conversations of how, how a kingdom we were um, prior to the colonization of the country. But we haven't taken out the role that the kingdoms play in our governance. When you go to the 1992 constitution, it's clearly stated in it that our chiefs are part of the governing structure of the country. And we know very well the influential role, the paramount, the, the tomb for uh, Osei Tutu plays yeah. in our governance structure. We know the role that Osei Tutu for a painting plays in our governance structure. We know the role that um, the, the chief from Volta region plays in the role. We know the role that the government plays in our role. So the chiefs continually have roles that they play in all of this buffet of governance and in this buffet of leadership. And um, you know, there are books that were written. Chino Achibe is one of 
one of the great writers when we, we talk about history of Africa and um, culture of Africa. So he wrote a book, Things Fall Apart, and uh, Mongo Park also wrote a book, Travels into the Interior of Africa. Maybe it will be good for the people that are watching to read. Um, Thomas Pakaham also wrote a book. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Please list it on the private chat so I can share with everybody okay. watching because yeah, I'm sure I'll they'll want it. to grab the books. Great, great. Yeah. So Things Fall Apart, it's a very good book. Many of us that did literature and English in high school read that book. Um, Chino Achibe wrote that book. And then Mongo Park wrote a book titled Travels into the Interior of Africa. And um, Thomas Pakaham wrote a book titled A Scrabble for Africa. And so we know when we look into the history of Africa and we look at um, who found Africa, um, the history traces it back to the Portuguese, that the Portuguese founded Africa. And it's not as though Africa was hidden that they needed to found, but um, it's just a, a matter of maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, I'll say semantics or something, it's just the found of Africa. And then um, 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 there's a man called Nguji Wa He wrote a book titled The Petals of Blood. And um, these are a number of books that people have written that sometimes when we grab it, especially as young people, as we look into our development as, um, as a country, we'll be able to look into it. So the project that I started on it is that, and I think that uh, Martin and Yvonne would agree with me, including Dante, is that if we would, I mean, we talk about the development of a country, we talk about democracy, we talk about the fact that people come to make promises that they do not live out to the promises because the tenor is a bit too small. Liberia practices a six-year tenor. So in Liberia, when you're president, you go for two terms and it's 12 years. Ghana over the years has practiced a four-year tenor. So if you if you come in as president, you go for two terms and it's eight years. So now, so now our, constitution our constitution is something that we need to look at. Do we need to amend the constitution so that it can align to the, to the development of the country? Do we need to um, um, amend our constitution so that it can be relevant for the 21st century? Because our constitution was written in the 20th century, okay? A 1992 constitution mm -hmm. was written with a, with a history of military regime, with a history of republic, and with a history of monarchical. Now, realize that the 1992 constitution also came into birth because the Ghanaian people needed a change. And so they needed a constitution that would bind them. But I mean, if you go to common law and all of those, we can look into that. But one of the things that we need to be very honest with ourselves as young people is that we need to take the development of our various countries into our hands. What does this mean? What this means is that I've seen very clearly that our politics has become very religious and very dogmatic. What do I mean? What I mean is that there are people that are born into a political party. And once they are born into it, it's a covenant issue, it's a blood issue. Nothing is going to change their mind to vote for political party A or political party B because they were born into a particular political party. What we need to do as young people is to begin to change the narrative. How do we change the narrative? In changing the narrative, it's clearly to be able to state that if we were born into political party A or B, look at the issues of political party A and B and begin to understand which of them will take us into our desired future. If you clearly decide that political party A or B will take you to your desired future, then you harness people around who, be, who would be able to endorse that particular decision. So I have seen, without mentioning any political party's name, I have seen, and I'm working on a research paper that states that there is a particular political party that understands the issues of the millennium. There is a particular political party that was birthed into the millennium that picked up the hems of the country at the onset of the millennium. And that political party understands what this millennium is. And then if the country would be able to break that cycle of a two year cycle that every two term, every two term we need to change a political party and bring another political party on, whether the political party is good or not, because it's become a culture in the country, it's like a cycle. And then that cycle retrogresses us back. And I know there are many people that are watching us that will cite examples of Singapore. I read, I read Singapore's book. I read from third world to first world. I read it. I read how they were able to change their country. When the president and the founder of Singapore came to Ghana, he looked at the country 
I read his research paper. He looked at Ghana and said that he was going to develop Ghana better than he was going to develop Ghana. He was going to develop his country better than Ghana was developed. At the time he came into the country, Ghana was far advanced than Singapore. But what did he do? He said that he was going to change the culture of Singapore. What was happening in Singapore at the time? People were living with chickens. And I mean literal chickens. Fowls that we eat, chickens. And Coco, people were living with chickens. And he said it was going to be very difficult for him to change that culture. So what is he going to do? He was going to start with the children in their schools. Mm, and educate them. The system. That is how, you know, a generation is changing 35 years. That is how Singapore was able to change from third world to first world in 35 years. And so all of us here, I'm sure, around the table would either be in our 30s or would be in our 40s. Play adventure. And I, I always say this, and I, I think it's true. If people are supposed to die according to age, the old people will die before we die. Play adventure. If people are supposed to die according to age. Now, play adventure, if we look at the expectancy, life expectancy rate in Ghana, then we can clearly state that by the time all of us are in our 70s, we would all be alive and well in the countries that we live in. So how do we change this narration and this conversation? How to change this is that we would make a decision that as young people, we would develop a plan, would develop a document, we would want to leave out with this document that in our lifetime and in our generation, like the people that fought for apartheid, like Kwame Nkrumah and the rest of our grandfathers that fought for the independence of this country, J.B. Danko and Co., like um, all the countries, name them, everybody that's ever lived for, they got to see that at the end of their life, they saw the liberation of their country. And I think that when we look at that, we'll be able to say very clearly that we live a country as we want it to be in our generation and in our future. Palgrave, what do you think about um, uh, uh, Rwanda? Um, obviously, Kagame is seen as a, as a dictator operating under uh, democ democracy. Um, what do you think about his leadership skills? I'll tell you, I have been to Rwanda. Um, I've had an opportunity of having conversations with um, Kagame. And I'll tell you one truth. Um, Kagame invited Rick Warren to come to Rwanda because he read The Purpose Driven Life. And um, he decided that he would put his country on, an, on a purpose-driven journey. Now, just imagine that impact of that book that made in the life of Rwanda. So we, they set up a team to be able to be in Rwanda to see how they can change the country and put the country on a purpose-driven journey. I am not sure that I have seen any leader that has either read any book written by anyone that has seen that the values of the books are good and has invited the author to come and take their country through it. Paul Kagame took his entire parliament through the Purpose Driven Life book. I have read the Purpose Driven Life book and it's an, an extremely good book on a 40 day journey. You know that Kagame's father was a leader in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And you know that the people, well, we, we, you talk about um, his dictatorship and all of those other things. Clearly, let's be, let's be very, very honest. In democracy, it's dictatorship. But in democracy, it's managed dictatorship. And in democracy, it's aligned dictatorship. And so it's not dictatorship that goes overboard the boundaries by his dictatorship that is within a sector of boundaries. And you know, when I, when I, when I, when I, when I, I love what Kegame is doing, I love the fact that he's very bold. I love the fact that he's very altruistic. I love the fact that he wants to be able to see his country develop. And he wants to see his country develop beyond himself. And um, I'm not sure if we can, we can pick up a Kegame scenario and put into our Ghana contest. The reason is that the systems are very, very different. In 1994, Rwanda went through a genocide. The genocide, you know, we let, let's be honest. Ghana, we don't have we don't have that history that aligns people to a common agenda. The history that we have that aligns people to a common agenda is a history that is forgotten. But 
some of the histories that are in some parts of the African countries. Yes. We're losing you slightly. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, go ahead. For me, I Let's try again. Go ahead. Okay, okay. The history that we have in Ghana is almost a forgotten history. But a number of the histories that are across some part of the world, especially on this continent, it's not a forgotten history. In fact, it's a history that comes to bear. No, Pago, we're, we're yes, losing no. you. Pago, we're losing you. We're losing you. Oh, I can hear you. Hello? Is it clear? Okay, Everything now it sounds better. better. Now it sounds better. It Go sounds ahead. Better. Okay, now it sounds better. Right. Okay, is it clear? Very good. Yes, is it clear? yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the history that we have in this country is almost a forgotten history because that history does not align people to a common agenda in a common cause. But the history, we don't have a nationalistic history that aligns us to a common cause. But when you go to, when you go to Rwanda and you want to put together a nationalistic history that would align people to a common cause, it's the genocide. And I am not sure that the genocide, the 1994 genocide can ever be forgotten in the history of Rwanda. Even when you come to um, Uganda, I'm not sure that the people of Uganda would ever forget the president Idi Amin Gala. I'm not sure that they would ever forget the brutalities that he put together. And so that collective nationalistic history is almost always important to forge an agenda for the future. We as a country, we don't have that. We don't have that nationalistic history. In fact, if there is any reference to any history that will give us a nationalistic agenda, it will be the 6th March 1957 history. That would be one that would align us to a common cause and a common agenda. And so in 2020, if we need to develop a 10-year developmental agenda for the country, we need to pick up that collective history from 1957 so that it is not party aligned, it is not ethnic oriented, but it is a history that comes from our forefathers, that comes from mm. the red, the gold, and the green with a black star in the middle of that. But obviously, there are good, there are good examples that we can pick from Rwanda that would be implemented in our country. But you know, when, when President Obama visited this, this country, he stated that we need to build systems and structures. I think that right. when, our, when we put away the politics, let's build system and structures. When we build system and structures, that is really what governance is about. And I'm sure Yvonne would agree with me. Governance is really about systems and it's about structures. It's not the politics of it. So I put up the conversation that people want to do politics and people want to think that governance is politics. But there is a distinction between that. There is governance and there is politics. And there are people in politics that do not understand what governance is. There are people in politics that do not understand what leadership is, but they just do politics. But if we want to rule a country and we want to develop a country, we should be able to decide that we are going to develop and lead this country on, on three parallel legs. Three parallel legs is on governance, it's on leadership, and it's on politics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yvonne, what do you think is the gap standing in our way from reaching our desired future as a continent? Thank you, um, Denta. And Paul River Martin, some really good points there. I was nodding all along and I'm so you know privileged to be on this panel with you because I just get to that. You get it. You understand, you know, you, you understand what the key issues are. Um, you know, I think from my point of view, you know, as a governance professional is good governance is one that is lacking, um, you know, on, on the continent. And I know that the you know, various organizations and individuals have tried to kind of embed good governance processes, you know, but it's not enough embedding those processes. It's about reviewing, monitoring, making sure that they're fit for purpose, making sure that, you know, um, the cultural sensitivities are, are kind of taken into consideration when you're putting those structures in place. So I'm quite pleased that Paul Grave mentioned talking about the traditional rulers. You know, where is their role in that governance structure? You know, 
that it needs to be there needs to be that link understanding that we had our kingdoms you know before independence how do we make sure that those kingdoms and those institutions that have worked well for us many many years ago are incorporated in there you, you, know, you know so for me a key area is where the challenge is for the continent is getting a governance system and systems in place that's fit for purpose that takes into consideration a people's culture and a, you know a, a, and the cultural sensitivities around that so you can't take a one-size-fits-all approach you know and think that would work in one country it will not even if when you run a business you can't use the same structures to run another business in, you know under a different jurisdiction so for, uh, the key part for me is you know making sure that you know those systems are quite culturally sensitive and really fit for purpose okay martin um do you think our system allows for intellectuals like yourself to contribute meaningfully to our continent no no I think it's all based on party lines. Okay, um, for me, for me to get into the role, the kind of role that I want to in in Africa or specific to Ghana, I need to be associated with party A and B. If I'm not associated with party A and B, they don't want to know me. Even if I call them, they don't want to even pick my call. Why? It's just because they they know that I'm position that I'm looking for. Uh, they will probably need, you know, some, some, they will also want to benefit from that position. And so that's why you need to be part of that party. And so they will go for somebody who is not even fit to be in that, to be, to, to be what, given that position because they will yeah. benefit, because they will benefit in, a, in, a, in the long term. They are thinking about their party survival rather than the nation. So, so, yeah. so what they do, what they do is they take a lot of incompetent people incompetent people filling up positions and um, just for the sake of it, because at the end of the day, they will get a benefit. Is if, if there is anything, it's gonna come back to the party. And and that, and that that's what is is actually crippling the economy of, of our continent. Because mm -hmm. if the economy is gonna thrive, you need intellectuals. You need those who have worn the T-shirt and done it to come and do it. But the thing is, they wouldn't want to even look at me because of, well, I'm not being maybe affiliated to their party. And so that is that is what is actually, you know, giving us the problem. But when you come to Europe, it's different. They, I'm telling you, they don't really care if you are from party or party B, as long as you you have you are you you are qualified or, or you are merited. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They're gonna give you the position, you know, irrespective of your party affiliation. Okay. So come to think of it, even you have conservatives. You know, uh, 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 you know, uh, inviting the likes of uh, you know the the part, uh, Labour Party leader in, when it comes to uh, this um, EU, what do you call it, Brexit, that it, they have to come to some, some some kind of a compromise. You know, it wouldn't happen in Africa. It wouldn't happen in Africa because they tend to think that everything that it must achieve, it must be to the benefit of their party. The credit must be to the president. The credit must be to 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 the party and not to uh, uh, the 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 uh, not to the benefit of the national interest. So we need to be careful here. We are we we are actually crippling our economy. We are mm -hmm. we we are giving no hope to to the youth of the of this of this country. And I I, I mean I, I I quite I'm really happy about what Pergrave is doing. But the thing is, if the things things are going to change for the youth, it must come from it, ha it has to happen from a uh, top down. Things must change from top down. You can you can educate the youth, um, you know, stir them up, motivate them. But if there are no jobs, if they, if they are not giving the opportunity, if the, the jobs are not being created, if the opportunity are not being created by the government, because come to think of it, when it comes into power, they have to feed their people. In other words. You know, make sure that the people that bring them into power, they, they satisfy them. So, so to to the to to the well, detriment of the people. And so, what we are talking about here is not a fair system. It's not a fair system, and the country is for all of us. And and that's why I mean, I'm not into politics here, yeah, and I don't want to get into politics. But the thing is, if this nation if, of or Africa is going to thrive, we need to we need to come off this 
you know, uh, high horse. Let us come off this high horse where people tend to think that they know too much. And when when they get into their position or when they get into government, they forget about the others. You know, we need to build the kind of consensus, bringing people. People, there are a lot of people, Delta, you can bear with me, there are a lot of people in, in, in Europe, uh, Africans in the diaspora that want to come back and help. But the atmosphere is not conducive. It's not conducive, not created a conducive environment. And, you know, the other time my daughter was asking me, you know, if that even if we go to Ghana, where is the where is the hospital? What, how is the how is the health system? Is the is the health system you know right enough like uh, uh, what we have in the UK? And that is not it's 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 not it's not there. It's not there. So we need to build a consensus. If you need help, you and, and, and I need help. I'm, I need to reach out to you, irrespective mm. of your party colors, and then mm. build that consensus. NDC, MPP. This is not. This is not helping. And the fact of the matter is, it's not helping Ghana. It's not, yeah. and it's not just. Uh, it's not just Ghana. Nigeria. Uh, you go to wherever. It's, it's mm. not helping the continent yeah. because we are so divided. We're so divided. Yeah. So then, yeah. back to I mean, Martin, I won't. I won't fight you. I feel like. like I, I, I feel like um, the atmosphere may never be conducive. And so we have to act. No, I'm, I'm being honest. I mean, if we want to wait, we can wait. But we have to act now as a generation. If you want to see a better hospital, we have to come and build those hospitals. Do you understand? We can't wait for the government to make it rosy for us. But we have to bring in the knowledge and the expertise and we have to fight to make sure that we are heard. And exactly like what Powell Grave is doing, he's raising the generation, he's, he's, he's setting their mind right now. It's a mindset, you know? And that's why, you know, for me, I always encourage the diaspora to go back home. Listen, if you look at Ghana, there are Chinese people, Italians, Brazilians, all of these people, and they're making money in our country. So if me and you, as Ghanaians who are from the diaspora, do not step up to also challenge, the, um, you know, to, to, to make a way for ourselves, then all of these people will still come and invest in our country, and we won't have anything. Hey, yeah, can I, can I interrupt? Yeah, mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is, yeah, Mm -hmm. Listen, I've been to Ghana myself, wanted to set up a big business. Do you know I had to run away? You know, I, I, I had to run away because the people were frustrated. You didn't have you didn't have power grave to help you. You didn't have their path to help you. Yeah, you wouldn't yeah. run away. Trust me, there are people that will make sure that you set it up. It's not easy. Nobody said it's gonna be easy or Martin. Yeah, I know. I'm not being negative here, but what I'm saying mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the mindset shouldn't change with just the youth the youth is they are ready they are ready to go for it but the thing is the powers they that be they also need to make some changes in, in other words if they see us coming they need to what also like you know this the small kind of support the support a little bit of support here we're not saying do something grand okay you do little by little and it will get people coming for instance, you talk about the Chinese. You talk about the Chinese. You put in a, a Chinese there, and you put in a, a retainee or, or a, a, a Ghanaian retainee, yeah, uh, uh, on the same on the same pedestal, and let them come and tell you what their experiences are. The Chinese will have an edge because they see him as what well, a white person. So this is why we need to disabuse. I mean, I think. Things that think no, things things got to change from our from the top down from the top. Do you know, great. You can do you interject. Know, you can no, interject. No, 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 but let him do land. You know, do you know, land. No, I just want to. I'm a businessman. I'm a business. I'm an entrepreneur. Can you know? I walk into an office, and somebody told me the only way I could get a contract, or I could get a contract, was to bring a white man from from Europe with me. No, it's true. It's true. I've heard that as what, well. What's what, what that? And I'm telling you, this is from my own experience. And so I'm saying. Things got to change from the top, and I'm not being negative. We want to come, and I'm. And if if things change, uh, and we don't want to sit down for things to change, but the thing is, if we the governance is about the structure, 
And if Yvonne will bear with me, governance is about structure. You put in the right structure so that the people will have the confidence in the structure. That's why people are staying here in Europe because they have the confidence in the structure. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Yo, I, 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 I am very grateful to Mr. Ferreira for his um, contribution and um, to Yvonne as well. I, I, I like to always put things in perspective, then it gives us a bit more optimism. Um, mm. And I'm, I'm happy that your daughter, um, um, Martin, your daughter is asking questions of clarity and um, um, differences. But you know, the United Kingdom was formed 927 AD, 927 AD. That's when the United Kingdom was formed. That's how old the United Kingdom is. Ghana was formed 1957. That's how old we are. The United States of America was formed 1500 BC. 1500 BC. BC is before Christ. BC. Yeah. Wait, 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 BC. So when we, we need to put these things in perspective, then for those of you that are in the diaspora, when you come from a diasporan perspective into an African context, you need to give room for error. That's one. You need to give room for error. Number two, you need to give room for patience. Ghana would become an extremely great country if everyone that has had the experiences that they have had around the world and the impact that they have had around the world would be patient enough, would be very, very patient enough. I would say something and because I'm not ruling out any of the experiences anyone has had, but we all come back to the main point that it's systems and structures, and systems and structures are not built overnight. Mm -hmm. Systems and structures are not even built in a decade. Yeah. Systems and structures are not even built in two decades. Systems and structures does not even change in three decades. These are things that have gotten into the fabrics of people. Fabrics has become their culture. They've lived with it. They've dined with it. They, it's, it's, it's who they are. It's true. If we need to pick people from a state, if we need to get people to learn what they have learned, to unlearn it, it's going to take a whole journey. And we, the people that are going to be the change makers, must be ready to go through that journey, must be ready to go through that milestone. You must be able to come back again. And you know, let me let me also say this. In fact, let me let me say this. There are there are diplomatic affairs at play when you come into any country that is developing. You must know that. There are I mean, everyone knows there are diplomatic interests. If a Chinese man is, is weighed above a Ghanaian citizen. I don't think that, I, and I'm not trying to say there is anything wrong with it, but we must always remember there is diplomatic work at play at the very highest level. And when those diplomatic works come and it's being at play, you must also realize the international relations that is at play. If we lose sight of that, then we lose the entire battle. I have been a victim of a number of things that Martin has shared. Because of the opportunities I've had traveling to 78 countries, there are people that I've met easily in the air, in terms of in the aeroplane, easily, with no protocols, that I've met in the air than I would have met when I was in Ghana with them. And those people I've met in the air have given me access to come to their offices anytime I got back into the country. So you know what I've decided to do? I decided to do, I, what I decided to do was that any international conference that happens that I know that these international people will be there, including my own ministers and my own presidents, I would fly and be there. When you fly and you are there, you join the conversation. Martin, I'll, I'll promise you, if you ever find any government official coming to the United Kingdom, coming to any program, and you attend, you would have an airing. When you attend and you exchange your complimentary card or hold conversations, they will tell you when you come to Ghana, look for me. You would have an hearing. There is always a route. And if you don't find out that route, you would go through those challenges. I would be very honest with you. 
If you meet any leader and you tell them, Martin, you've done this work for Volkswagen, you've done this work for Rolls Royce, if you won't meet any leader and say, I work with the, the um, royal family in England, you would have no challenge. But then the question is, must you work with the royal family in England? Must you work with Rolls Royce before you get before access? You get the errand, is that? And then also, you should always remember how young our country is and yeah. give room for that. If you but appreciate how young, yes. So go ahead, Dante. I mean, I know Yvonne, you're going to come in next, but you know, how long do we have to be patient for when we see other nationalities coming into the country and getting roles that? us in the diaspora can possibly have how pay how long do we have to be patient for some of these uh people in you know in governments and stuff have also lived in the diaspora they know mm. how it's like and so sometimes you feel like they should un have a better understanding for us who want to who want to return the zulus have a proverb i lived in south africa the zulus have a proverb and i will quote it it says ubuntu uguntu ugabantu yeah. It says that you are who you are because of other people. You are not an island. You don't exist alone. Now, for those of you in the diaspora, you know how it is like um, working with different types of people. When you are coming into the country, the country is built on a fabric of international diplomacy. And, 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 and once the country is being developed, like I rightly said, look, there is not going to be a challenge if you partner with people. And this is all about partnership. It's all about network. So once you're able to partner with people, once you're able to network effectively, I am very sure that at a stage when Ghana is 200 years old, when Ghana is 300 years old, we'll be able to clearly now see the disparities at play and be able to, even in our own intent, see how matured we are as citizens to be able to take affairs into our own hands. But at the moment, I think that we should continue to be on that partnership journey I think that we should continue to be on that mentoring journey. We should be able to continue to be on that curve. The reason is that the United Kingdom was set up, was found 927 AD. Ghana was found 1957. The United States of America was found 1500 BC. These countries, and that is why you are in the diaspora, because you are, you are learning, you are learning things from these countries to come and implement in a third world in a developing country. Look, look, right behind my house are people who live in kiosk, in an urban city. People who live in kiosk, in an urban city, who rent kiosk for 200 Ghana cities, which is about maybe, I, I can't remember my pounds now, but maybe $50, okay? Yeah. They rent kiosk and they live in those kiosks. In an urban city, these developments are important. Until we move people from chaos to brick and mortar, these issues do not matter. And that is how we need to develop as a country. And I think that the patience is important because I don't want to go into slave trade and I don't want to go into the history of slavery. But see how, see how slavery impacted very positively to the development of the Western world. See how they sold the slaves and see how the slaves helped in the development of their country. I think that um, the railway in the United Kingdom was not built by people from UK. It brought people from Russia to come and build the railway. You understand? So as we are developing, I think that the partnership is important. The network is important. And we should never forget the Zulu proverb that says, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ugabantu. You are not an island. You don't exist alone. You are who you are because of other people. So you come into the, you come from the diaspora. Bring the diaspora into the country. And as you bring the diaspora into the country, bring your network and your net worth into the country. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the assets that will be given to you will be given to you because you have a white man. The assets that will be given to you will be given to you clearly because you are capable of doing whatever business you state that you can. Mm. Yvonne, you wanted to say something, add to it. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and Paul, Paul Robert Martin, thank you very much. There's some really valid points there, you know, and, you know, I agree with you. Patience is important in anything really that you want to do. And from my experience, what I find is working with our community, for example, I need to have a lot of patience. 
you know, whereas if I'm working with, you know, like the predominantly white community, when I say get things done, put systems in place, it's happening very quickly. But I have learned that if you go into a different context, patience is very important. Again, um, to have those governance systems and structures in place for it to become a way of life, you know, as you said, Paul Brief, will take time. But the good news, I think, the good news for all of us is the fact that our countries or the countries in Africa now are not at a stage where they're self-sufficient. You know, they rely on international partners to, you know, to be able to build the country. And these international partners are now building in into some form of governance structure for them to be more accountable. So if we talk about, for example, the sustainability development goals, you know, goal number 16 is about, you know, democracy, rule of law, good governance in place, you know, making sure that it focuses on the people, the environment, peace, partnerships is another one in there. So partnerships are so important. So even if you're, you know, you, you are, you know, a, a Ghanaian born person in the diaspora and you want to go back home and do something, partnership is a great avenue. I'm a firm believer in partnerships and I encourage, you know, the organizations that I work with to partner with others because there is strength in that. And I think if partnership will then give you an opportunity for our own people to see that you're good at what you do, I think it's a great avenue because at the end of the day, our governments in Africa are being measured by partnerships. You know, if they go to the World Bank for funding, they want to see that they're actually creating good partnerships and they're supporting partnerships in country. That's probably why they do things with the Chinese. You know, that's probably why they do things with other foreign people. But if you go in, ask a person from the diaspora, you know, and you want to do something and you can throw it back into their face to say, you are required to show this level of partnership. And this is what I'm bringing to the table with Joe Blocks on my side to come and deliver this project. These are my credentials for using Martin as an example. You know, I've done X, Y, and Z with Rolls Royce. This is what I've achieved. I can turn this around, you know. I think that would open the door. And again, networking is so important. You know, I've been at events where, you know, I've met, you know, the vice president and various people when they're eating and basically they got up to stop eating and talk to me. And I'm thinking, only, you know, it's little me. Vice president stopped eating to talk to me, but he's heard a lot about my work and, you know, and, and what I do. So it is important. And let's realize that the international community has put systems in place that are pushing countries in Africa to move in the right direction, you know, to move in the right direction, to make sure that there's prosperity for all, you know, which is a key part of the sustainability development goals. So I would, you know, encourage anybody who is trying or who's hoping from the diaspora to go back home and do something like myself, which is my dream to go back and do what I do is Remain patient, work with the system, you know, work with the system and remain optimistic, you know, because the structures that have been put in place over here need to be put in place back, you know, back in the African countries before they can access key resources that they need to build the country. Okay, Yvonne, you have a question on, you have a question on the screen now. Okay. Can you read it out? Uh, you know, absolutely. You know, absolutely. I, you know, I never forget about this. It's about whom you know. So that is how it works there. So find somebody who knows the person that you need to see. You understand? Find somebody who knows the person that you need to see. I work with not-for-profits who are registered here in the UK and in Ghana, working with young people. When the leader is going to Ghana, he would ring me and say, is there anybody that we can see that can help us to push the young people agenda? You know, and then I will contact somebody I know in a higher place and say, who is the person responsible for young people? I get his contact. I make the connection. You understand? It's, you know, that is the culture. That is how the country works. And we can't change it overnight. That's the fact that we need to realize we can't change it overnight. But I'm a firm believer that it will change at some point. Absolutely, you understand? Absolutely. But you know, we need to work with the systems in place and make the small changes that we can make. 
Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, our children and, and, and our great grandchildren will be living in a Ghana, which is similar to the UK and other areas in Europe where we're living in, where, you know, you get into a role, not because of who you know, you know, or you get a, you get a contract, not because of who you know, because now, you know, the external regulatory environment, which is coming over governments in Africa is, if you're not self-sufficient and you're relying on IMF, World Bank, UNHDP and all that to support you to, you know, with various projects. You need to be showing that you are doing, you know, you are having, and I want to just pick up on the, the Sustainability Development Goal 16, that you've got the right governance in place. There's a more consultative style of doing things. You know, there is partnerships. You focus on the people, you know, decision making. You know, you have to have those those structures in place. So I am pretty optimistic that it will happen and it will happen in our lifetime. I agree. I agree. I hope so. You can read it out for us. Uh, okay. Should I read it out? Yes, please. Okay. Um, but we know what we must do. We need to do it all the times. You mentioned uh, historical fuel for telling us what we need to do and what not. We know what works and what doesn't. Why not just execute? I'm lost. Is it really hard? Um, I'm not sure I get his question. Um, he says, in the times you mentioned about historical fuel for telling us what we need to do and what not, we know what works and what doesn't, but not just execute. Basically, we, I think what he's saying is that we know, as Africans, we know what works and what doesn't but we still don't execute it. I think that's what he's saying. Well, I'm, 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 not, sure, I'm not sure Africa has gone into a stage where we know what works, uh, because uh, if, we, if we know what works, um, we'll do what works. So um, like I said, it's a gradual process. Um, Africa is still on a learning journey. And um, as we learn, we implement. And I'm, I'm not sure that we are sharing that Africa is all gloom. Um, Africa is bright. Africa is beaming. Africa is the next big thing to happen to the world. Everybody around the world is coming to Africa. People talk about leadership. Africa is showing exemplary leadership. Good leadership that even the West is copying from. And so um, we know what works and Africa is doing what works. And I'm sure that if we remain very optimistic without isolating cases, because sometimes you isolate cases and make it a broader case, but some your experience may not be um, a thousand people's experience. And so it's important mm -hmm. that we put that in proper perspective as well. In this country, okay, I have have a oh wow, Sorry. so many things. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a lot to go through before we wrap up. And how come Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, and other countries that form the Tiger, Asia Tigers, develop quickly, uh, many of them gaining independence at the same time than we did? Okay, so what's the question? <laughs> um, so why are we not developing as, as fast as they are, basically? That's the question. Well, I, I, I think that we are developing. Um, when, you, when, you look at, when you look at our, our history at the moment, um, this present government, we have seen that the government has taken on the battle and the challenge of digitization. And so um, we are digitizing everything that we come in. And this, this is all part of the systems and the structures. But like I said, um, Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, I'm not sure they have the kind of history that we have of 63 years. And um, we've gone through military regime. Military regime took the better part of this country. And everyone that has read through it, lived through it, will tell you that the military regime took the better part of this country. We can clearly count close to about 28 years of democracy, active democracy, out of our 63 years. And so if you compare Singapore, Malaysia, and South Korea, it's really out of place. Because in terms of technology, Ghana is even now getting to the speed of it in terms of making sure that our rural, urban, urban it is equal in terms of various amenities that are available. And so um, we, we are digitizing the economy and digitizing the country. 
um, the Vice President, His Excellency Alhaji Dr. Mahmoud Obamia, has been piloting this very strongly. Um, last week, he was at the Birth and Death Registry. Um, the Cabinet has approved the digitization of the Birth and Death Registry. I'm sure this comes as an excitement, especially to Martin, um, whose daughter is going to be living in Ghana in the future of Ghana. You know, that we are digitizing, we are digitizing the birth and death registry. We are digitizing the port and harbor. We, everything is gradually getting digitized. And um, you should appreciate us because this is a country that did not even believe in the digitization of things. But now we, and, and once a country begins to digitize, then you can clearly state that we are moving faster because the world is going AI. The world is going digitization. And that's clearly important as we look at it. Mm. Um, there's Claudia uh, says, how well is AU working towards the building and the betterment of the continent? Well, AU, AU, AU is, a, is, is a mission. And it's a mission that comprises of the 55 countries of the continent. And so AU as a mission meets regularly. And when they meet regularly, it's on an agenda for the continent. And um, I, I think that AU is contributing very significantly to every single country's development. There, there are roles and responsibilities for the various unions. When you look at um, ECOWAS, ECOWAS has a commission which they set out to achieve. And, and a number of these unions clearly set out is for economic freedom, to ensure that there's continual peace, to, to ensure that human rights are not abused, and all of that, there's rule of law. So if you look at it and you go into the deep part of the politics and the governance of it, you realize that AU is playing a key role in a number of these agendas. The peace that the continent experiences is contributing from AU. The stability and the human rights that the continent experiences is also contributing from AU. And I think that um, when the conversations of AU is put into proper perspective, it aligns very well to the development that AU is contributing. Okay, there's another um, comment or question for you. What are we doing in Ghana to improve economic power? Is the government enticing diaspora to come in and resettle and contribute? To Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that um, Ghana, and I, I mean, I don't speak as a government official. I need to, I need to put that across. But um, we, we, we were in this country when we had a homecoming. And um, that was over 400 years um, since um, people left the shores of the continent of Africa. And um, people needed to find their place on the continent. And His Excellency Nanadu Dakwe Kufuado gave the continent an opportunity for people to come into the country. I recall very well that hundreds of people were given citizenship during the year of return. And the year of return is it's, it's positioned as an opportunity for the diaspora to be involved in the economic activities of the country. We are done with the year of your return. Now there's a conversation of beyond the return. And I think that it belongs on the diaspora to take advantage of the year beyond the return because the beyond the return does not end because that's a continuation of the year of return. That what can the diaspora do? And so all the things that you have learned in your short stay in the United Kingdom, that you feel you can introduce and inculcate into a developing country like Ghana, come in. If you lived in UK for 20 years, you've lived in UK for 30 years, you've lived in 50 years, come in and be patient and see that the country develops. And I like it when Yvonne says that our children are going to live in the future of Ghana that will look better than the United Kingdom and the United States of America. Um, Martin, you, you've got a book called The Awakening. Are we awake? Have we awoken? Are we awake? You mean for Africans? Or... Yeah. Um, I would say, I would say we're getting there. I would say we're getting there. And uh, the thing is, we need to wake up and, and smell the coffee. Uh, I'm not here to advocate for anybody. I'm, I just always want to be neutral. And um, for me, the reality is uh, the world is moving at a pace where Africa need to catch up. Well, we have historical facts where we don't want to go to the BCs and ADs, but we, the fact of the matter is uh, we, we are in a race at the moment. We are in a race at the moment. 
and we need to get our people competing and we and i, I really like that this topic this is about leadership and governance what 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 leaders who are our leaders are, are we able to trust our leaders to do what they said they would do um, and people come in and do uh, be part of a government for four years uh, and then, then they, they, they campaign for another four years and they go and they are forgotten about and, and the people are not you know conversant with what is actually going on so 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 the fourth republic for instance we need to go back and say okay within the fourth republic this is what we've done and 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 i know probably might come up with the statistics but the thing is <laughs> we, we we need to know yeah we need to know whether they we we are conversant with the progress we the people are aware of any progress at all it's not about roads and infrastructure it's about the mindset it's about the mind we need to change our mindset from the bottom up top down and 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 we are getting there i was i'm not saying you know me we're not getting there but the thing is at the moment the train is not stopping it's not going to wait for us whether we like it or not it's not going to wait for us we it's not waiting for us we need to catch up and once if once we catch up then they will, the world will take notice of us. the world will take notice of us and so when you ask whether we are working, I'm saying we are slowly <laughs> getting there. But the thing is, we need some shock. What you can is resuscitate in these stations to come in. And that would depend on our leaders. That would depend on our leaders taking bold decisions. They have to be what um, uh, very, very much what um, they they need to be having that kind of inventive kind of mind they they need to come up with ideas that are outside of the box and not about all party party politics you know obama i mean obama why did why did people vote for him massively in the united states because he came with a different kind of politics he came with a different kind of ideas you know reaching out to to the other other party and all that so we need if we have will be awakened Denta, the thing is, the leaders must take the mantle. They need to be bold and introduce the roadmap. If I'm to ask you, Denta, do we have any road roadmap? Pargrave is going on about all this. Do we have any roadmap that is saying, okay, in ten years' time? No, no, I'm telling you, I know. <laughs> road, road, roadmap, roadmap that the youth are aware that the seventy percent of the population are aware. That's, mm -hmm. are we, we, are, we are not staying on Facebook and posting things, but the people on in, on the ground, they are aware that this is where the nation is heading to. This is where we are going to in the next 10 years. And, and that is driving them. That is waking them up. That by the, ne the next 10 years, I'm going to own my own car. It's not impossible. A child here in this country, you talk about, okay, the fact that this country has been built over years, but I'm telling you, we can do it within 20 years. If we have a roadmap, 20 years is not a long time for the youth to be equipped yeah, to do what the, the peers are doing in the <laughs> United Kingdom in Europe. I am telling you, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, oh yeah. Pablo, you, know, you don't agree? It, oh yeah, because, because- <laughs> Well, you know, I like, I, like, I like the adrenaline and the enthusiasm of, of Martin. You, I'm telling you, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure we can. I'm not sure we can turn around. I'm not sure we can turn around ideologies and concepts in 20 years. Um, um, two decades is a very short time. Um, and so I, I would agree that we can we can progress beyond where we are because um, yesterday but is how not the same. How is how, how, how is um, Dubai able to to develop so quickly? How exactly. I'm sorry. Dubai, how, how is Dubai, Dubai able to develop so quickly? Dubai? You know, the, the governance structure of Dubai is very different from the governance structure in Ghana. It's, it's important. I mean, Yvonne knows, in Dubai is, 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 is the, it's a family. It's a royal family. It's the Emiratis. It's, it, that is what it is. I have I've watched, and I know Martin is going to say it, but, but you know, I can't run away from the history, and I can't run away from the research, and I can't run away from the data and the statistics because that really is going to inform our 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 future decisions. Dubai was a desert, real desert. It was an intentional growth. Dubai's growth was an intentional growth, and Dubai as well 
does not run the kind of democracy we run. Dubai is an Emirati, it's, it's, it's a monarch. Dubai is a monarch. And when you have a monarch, the development of a monarch is very different from the development of a democracy. It, and we need to be able to put those things in perspective. Let, let us backtrack and let us go back into history and decide that we would make Ghana a monarch. And let us imagine how Ghana would be under a monarch. So we know that we have two major political parties in this country. Let's decide that these political parties, one is a monarch, and we would give them 50 years each, 50 years each, and let's predict the kind of country it will be under NDC and the kind of country it will be under MPP as a monarch. I'm, I'm talking about the cohesion. If you, if you are talking about um, the kind of rule, the monarchy as compared to democratic rule, uh, we have issues because we are still divided. We are still uh, divided. We are, our, our division is like, it's, it's, it's too, <laughs> the word is too big, you know, between the MPP and NDC. But what I'm saying is, if we have a roadmap based on the unity of, of government, you know, we, we, unity of government where the two parties come together and say that this is our nation and this is where we are heading towards. Within 20 years, we need to change the mindset. The, the fact of the matter is this country is still going on a tangent, uh, the tangent that is not giving hope. It's not giving hope to, to a, a 16 year old uh, a, a teenager or a teenager in, in, in a, a remote area in Ghana. It's not giving any hope to them. They have no hope. How can we change that? And I'm so saddened for you to say, oh, it's not going to happen within 20 years, no matter because of because of the uh, style of government. The fact of the matter is if we decide, if we decide that there's something has got to change, there was something that actually got the Chinese to say, no, we are not staying here anymore. We have, we have to change and they change. And now, now, now they are not just industrialized, they are a superpower. And you tell me how long did it, it took them to achieve this? We can we can we can use uh, or, or we we can give a number of excuses, okay? And twenty years time, we will still be having this conversation. Then time, we will still be yeah. having this conversation. Yeah. There's come a time where we need to say, absolutely, whether you are MPP, whether you are NDC, for the common goal, this is what we are doing. You know. This is what we are doing. And I, I really commend even Jerry Jerome when he said Vision 2020. At least he did something. At least he put some vision out there and said, this is what we are going to do Vision 2020. At least he came up with a policy which actually he was driving everyone along. After the Vision 2020, who has come out to say we have a vision? Uh, there, is, there, is, there is a plan. There is a plan that has been put in place is going to be launched by the President, His Excellency Nanado Danko Kufuado, is the Ghana at 100 plan. That is in the next 37 years, um, when Ghana is going to be 100, there's a plan that has been developed by the National Development Planning Commission. And so um, I, I have seen that document, I've read through that document, okay. I've seen the pages. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. yes. Somebody's saying that, Dr. Park is saying, so why can't we create an intentional roadmap for 20 years? Yes, that's what I'm saying. So there is an intentional roadmap that has been developed for the next 37 years. It's actually even beyond 20 years. Okay, so there's an intentional roadmap that has been developed for the next 37 years and it's going to be launched this year. Because in the next 37 years, Ghana is going to be 100 and that's 2057. So there's a vision 2057 that is going to be launched. And when, when I mean, I've seen that document, I've read through the document. When it's, going, when it's launched, you will see the various developmental stages and processes that Ghana needs to go through. And this document is going to be gazetted, that is going to be given to the country. I know that uh, people are going to raise the conversation of the century one, the century one that was done um, during the NDC time. Now it's important that the NDPC, which is the National Development Planning Commission, is a, it's a, it's a constitutional requirement under the office of the president. Now, once they put together this developmental agenda, which is the Ghana 100 agenda, it's going to be an agenda that is adopted by the country. 
that cabinet accepts it, goes to parliament, and is accepted by both house, both, both chambers, and both minority and both majority would accept it and put it into law in terms of its implementation. And I'm very sure that we are going to see a new Ghana. And so for Martin and for the rest of the people, that Martin, your children are going to come to Ghana and live here, where they enjoy this country, they will see that that roadmap is being developed that goes beyond political borders because this is an intellectual team, um, technical team that has put together this 37 year developmental plan in terms of various airports that must be in various regions. And we have even started it. You see that there's been an additional um, six region to the already existing 10 region. Okay, Rollins added some regions. Gan um, Nana Rudanko Kufado, His Excellency the President, has added six additional regions. And it's all to decentralize, decentralize the economy so that we can see the development grow at par. So I promise, I'm, I promise the country, I promise the Facebook viewers that in the next 37 years, there's a plan, a roadmap which is beginning from now, this year, 2020, up until 2057, we'll see the development of Ghana at par with the rest of the world. Okay, it is common knowledge that a, a lot of young people shy away from politics because they feel like it's just too corrupt or the system would not allow them to make a difference. Do you think that this is a valid argument? Um, for Paul Gray, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, sure. Well, um, it's a valid argument. Um, that's why it's an argument, okay? Um, it's a valid argument, that's why it's an argument. Um, the thing is this. The fabrics of the society is formed on values, on culture. And what people have done for a very long time is almost always very difficult for people to change in a very short time. I, I have been on this journey and I can promise you that it's not been easy, but I can also promise you that there are times when I've had to stand my ground on my own value system that aligns very well to things that I believe in, that does not get me to do the normal things that the normal people will do because they've been in the system for long. And so that is where it starts from. If you look at the discouragement of the system, and for that reason you will not enter, then you would really not enter. But the question is, how do we survive? Because how do we survive? How to survive in a politerate society is really important. So the survival instincts, the survival structures, the survival values, the survival quality is important to come to play when you are in the midst of scavengers, in, in, in a way to put it. So if you find yourself in the midst of scavengers and you are the only lone ranger, are you, is the question, are you going to be part of them or you are going to be an away from them? The thing is this, if you are a reformist, you always need to wait till you have the maximum authority and power to reform. And I, I'm sure Yvonne would agree that until you have that level of influence, to bring that level of reformation, you always need to hold your guard. And the fact that you're holding your guard does not mean you have compromised. It only means that you're waiting for that opportune opportunity when you have that level of influence to be able to bring the reform that is needed. So I encourage young people, if you want to get into politics, if you want to get into governance, if you want to get into leadership, the time to start is now. The time not to start is when you are old and very, very old. The time to start is now because then you can be able to clearly see what is wrong with the elders and what they do that is wrong and learn the good things from them and be able to make a decision that I will do this, I will not do this. And that's the, really the only way to learn because it's good to also learn the tricks and be able to say that this is how the tricks work. And because I know the tricks, I'm not going to fall into that victim. Um, how do how do you want to move? Oh, Chrissy, put the question back on for you've just taken the question off. Please put it back if you can. Um, okay. Um, somebody's saying about us having one language. Do you agree with that, Palgrave? 
Uh, no, I don't agree with that. <laughs> I don't agree with that. That doesn't foster development at all. Um, I, I, I don't know what somebody think of that. I, I, I think that um, it, our differences are good. And um, it's important that we, we uphold our differences and um, value our differences. But isn't that, isn't that a, a barrier that, you know, uh, language, we can't communicate with somebody that's living, you know, maybe in a northern region that's speaking a different language. If we all spoke one language, it would be easier to educate in each other and also to understand each other? You know, there is one official language in Ghana, and that's English. And everyone who has educated himself can at least speak English. That is why I'm excited about a free SHS, which is bridging the gap of the illiterate becoming literate. It is very, very important that we grow up people from a state of illiteracy to a state of literacy. And so once people can speak English, I think that's good enough. If you enter into a community and you can't speak any of their languages, get a translator, it makes life easier. If your L2, which is your left hemisphere, works very well for you and you can learn that language, it's good enough. But you know, in terms of language, let me just chip this in. Ghana is surrounded by French speaking countries. If anyone is going to be global enough, that person should pick up a French speaking language. That's really important. That, that must be the conversation so that you're able to interact with your neighbors. That's important. And then if you have opportunity, because once you learn French, you can speak Spanish. Well, you speak Spanish and then you speak Portuguese. It's just simple. So they, they are just important languages. But you know, sometimes you don't want to think, you don't want to make someone feel that his language is better than your language. But globally, if you put the statistics together, I think that two thirds of the world speak English and one third of the world speak um, French and Spanish and Portuguese and others. So let's let's just go. We say that Ghana, you know, is English, but really is it English? Uh, a lot of our people don't really speak English. They don't speak English oh, because they're illiterate. English. They don't speak English because they are illiterate. That's that's the that's the that's the thing. You know, they don't speak English because most of them are form four leavers. They left school very early. And that's why in the advent of things in this new decade, in terms of 2020 to 2030, there is an educational policy to educate everybody at least to the minimum level of college, high school, college, to the minimum level. So if your parents cannot take you to school, the country is taking a responsibility of your education from the very basic level right up to the senior high school level, which is minimum. And I think that um, when, when we have various opportunities, we should be able to even advance that to a tertiary level. If the country gets more money, we should be able to advance that to a tertiary level where if you pick up five Ghanaians, four out of five of them would be graduates. And that's really the goal in terms of where we should get to. Mm. Yvonne, do you agree with that? Do you think, I mean, our language, do you think, how important do you think our language is? I, I'm all in favor of learning different languages, you know, as a parent. I just use an example as a parent, you know, I know that for my child to be able to function and communicate around the world, he needs to be able to speak my language, you know, I'm Fanti, you know, um, be able to speak English. He was born in England, his dad is French, he's learning French and he's learning Spanish. You understand? Because we need to raise, you know, a, a community that can interact because we are now seeing that we're becoming more global and we're going to be interacting with people outside of Africa or outside of Ghana and in Europe and other areas. So learning, you know, a different language or having one common language being English, which will give us the opportunity to communicate with others and learning other languages that helps us to communicate with our neighbors on the continent. It, it, it's very vital. Um, you know, understanding, speaking a traditional language is great, but, you know, we are becoming a global, we are becoming global, we are all global citizens. And we need to be able to communicate, you know, in a language that, you know, the, the person that we want, we would meet would be able to communicate in. So I am all in favor of, you know, having that diversity when it comes to um, the different languages. Okay. Martin, why do you think that Africa keeps looking to the West for solutions? 
Um, why do we find it difficult to come up with our own tailored solutions? Because we have that dependency syndrome, you know, it's just, yeah. it's just that is with that dependency syndrome. We, we've we been taught uh, from right from the beginning that the, the, the West uh, are our masters and everything that we do, we need to seek their help and we need to let them, you know, even sign it off for us. And so that, that is, that is a lie. Uh, that is a lie that most of us have believed in. And so that is being perpetrated, you know. So what we need to do now is to um, give the kind of the, kind of the confidence to the people. And how do we give the confidence to the people? Because you will need to give the confidence to the people so that they start to depend, they stop depending on the West. And I'm not saying we, do, we shouldn't build bridges with the West or we do stuff with the West. But the thing is, we have been depending on them for far too long, and 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 that is getting them to dictate the pace of our development. Mm -hmm. That is true. They are dictating the pace of our development. Come to think, if you go to the French countries here, yeah, and, and I believe it's even in Ghana, uh, the contracts or whatever their their budget uh, uh, is, must be approved by the French government because they have to even put eighty five percent of what uh, colonial debt they have to put. In the in their financial reserves in, reserves in in, in 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 France, and so they are depending on France actually for their day to day activity. And I'm sure it's, it's the same with with Ghana. Probably they need even the uh, the budget approval from their colonial masters. And so that syndrome is still there. We have to break free. And I'm not saying we we just do it drastically. What we need to do this one it comes back to the 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 the, the roadmap. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm happy that Nana Kufuadu has got that kind of, uh, at least a vision to where he says that Ghana beyond the aid of what? Uh, beyond the aid of, beyond aid. I don't know how he put it. He put it. Ghana but, beyond uh, aid. Ghana beyond Ghana aid. Beyond, yeah, Ghana beyond aid. But what are we doing? What are we doing to break free? What are we yeah. doing to break free? It, 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 must, it must give us the details the actual details the steps that are being taken for us to break free because we are highly dependent on the west and, and it is high time for us now watch this it is has time it's high time for us to start managing our own affairs when i'm saying managing our own affairs where are our resources going to we have gold we have oil we have diamond and and i don't know where they're going bauxite, <laughs> bauxite. And I'm telling you, um, Dubai has only got what? Oil. Dubai has just got oil. We've got everything. And yet we're not, we're not there. We are not even mm -hmm. halfway there. Mm -hmm. you know, so we've got to, we've got to, you know, we've got to uh, look at ourselves. So that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We have got to look at ourselves. Look at ourselves and say, there is something wrong with the system. There mm -hmm. is something wrong with the system. When we find, we, 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 when we say we find, uh, oil, we celebrate, but then we bring the we bring them the the Western uh, countries, whoever to come, and they draw the contract taking higher percentage. And I want yeah. to give me the statistics, bring the breakdown. How many what percentage are we getting from our own oil? I, I wouldn't be surprised that it's less, even less than thirty or twenty percent. It, it's so so. I don't know what what is going on. It's just <laughs> listen. If if we find an oil, the oil and we know that we can't get sixty percent or seventy percent, let it be there until we until we we've, we've got the resources, until we've got the equipment to do it ourselves. Why then? Do, why do we have to rush just because somebody want ten percent or somebody want twenty percent? Mm -hmm. No, we've got to wait. We've got to wait. Equip ourselves, even if it takes ten years, to equip ourselves to be able to do our the, the stuff our our own way and we learn mistakes we learn from it let's let's do it that's how we, we break free please mm. see the lives of south korea they didn't get here just because uh, of uh, of the fact that uh, they 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 wanted to be here they took drastic decisions and if you want me going to it i'll go into it they took drastic decisions <laughs> I think you know what this, I, we're gonna we're gonna have to definitely do a part two. I think yeah. all my shows there's a part two, part three, part four because it's like we 
we are unleashing a lot of knowledge. We are unleashing a lot of things that um, uh, we need to discuss. You know, people need to hear. Um, mm -hmm. We've got so many comments that we can't even go through and we're coming up to two and a half hours. So I'm, I'm going to ask the last uh, few, just one or two questions now. Um, so as we know, the youth uh, literally hold the future of our continent, Africa in their hands. How can we start enabling in them the right values, the thought processes that would help them create the future we desire? So that question goes to Yvonne first and then the rest of the panelists. Great, thank you. You know, it's, it's a very important question. Um, and I think, you know, we need to work with our youth to prepare them for the future. You know, and Palgrave, I look at you because, you know, you, you, you're home, you're home in Ghana and, and, and you can make an influence in these areas. But this is how I see it, that we start educating our youth, you know, with things like youth parliaments, you know, understanding the constitution, understanding how Ghana was built, giving them a chance, you know, to sit around the table, you know, with ministers and cabinets to share their views, to have that representation from young people, you know, that young people then know that politics is not for, you know, people who are over 40, over 50, over 60, but young people actually bring something to the table. And I believe that, you know, even teaching that as part of our curriculum back home, you know, that children learn to take part. And I remember when I was growing up in Ghana, you know, we used to have elections in school and you'd have to write your own manifesto and, you know, for people to vote for you. All these activities encourage young people to give them a taster of politics is, you know, I used to call it student politics, you know, and you see those ones which are, who are born leaders with those natural ability to get people to follow them, to get people to listen to what they're saying. And we need to be able to identify those young people and put, you know, let them have a seat around the table. You know, so with the work that Paul Griff is doing, and I hope that the Duke of Edinburgh's award, you know, that you know you're doing, incorporates some of these things around leadership skills for young people. It has to be, you know, it has to be rolled out nationally, you know, and to get that support from government that these young people, when they're identified, are helped to understand, you know, how politics work. And in future, 10 years time or 15 years time, you could see a young person who's gone through that program actually running for MP in his local community. And it can also be done to, through not-for-profit activities where they go into communities so then they show their ability to bring people together, their ability to solve problems, their ability to get people to take them on that journey to solve those issues that they identify. But it needs to be incorporated at a very young age. Absolutely, absolutely. I'll go to Paul Grave on that question. Okay, sure. So um, thank you so much, um, Dante and Yvonne and Maxwell. I think it's been a very good conversation um, this evening. I would clearly agree with um, Yvonne that, yes, it's important that young people are trained. And um, I would state that people need to identify their purpose. And um, when people identify their purpose, they need to align it with their passion. And then when people align it to their passion, the people need to ensure that they go through a process. And um, finally, they need to ensure that they get to a final destination, which is their product. And so in terms of genealogy, people must identify their purpose, identifying their passion, put their purpose and passion in a process and then get to a final destination. And so people do um, new year reviews in terms of resolution, people do strategic plan, um, people do reviews. But as you do your reviews and do your strategic plan, begin to start developing your own journey and look at what that journey will look like in your own lifetime. And I think that if we're able to put that together, we should be good and flying. Martin? Martin, do you have, um, can you answer the question as well? Well, so, I mean, what I would say is 
to empower the youth, we we have to encourage them. You know, um, they shouldn't, for me, what I would say, they shouldn't be uh, too much dependent on the government. They shouldn't be too much dependent on the government. You know, they have to um, take the bull by the horn. You know, we need to encourage them to say their destiny is in their own hands. Their destiny is in their own hands. The only way is for them to compete. I mean, for me, I am so much concerned about the comp from, from the co the competition out there with with the the Western uh, uh, peers because I'm in IT and and I am telling you, if we are we don't double up our steps, we will be left behind in terms of the youth. They are still going to be left behind. And so what we need to do is to just like just like when you go to India. Uh, they took the power. They 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 uh, they, they actually uh, 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 took advantage of the technological advancement, you know, and, and in terms of what the world was putting out there. And most of them got educated. A lot of them got ed educated, got into this technology, and today they are part with their Western peers. And so a lot of the Western countries are now going to India and getting them, you know, they will do everything to even what get them into Europe just to 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 help them out in in in, in uh, uh, well, other jobs and all the things of, that they want them to do. So what I will say is we need to empower them. We need to empower the youth and get them to believe in, their, in themselves. Get them to start. You don't wait to have to wait for the government to do anything. Start searching for opportunities. There are opportunities out there, not just restricted to Ghana. You, you, you have to be, they have to have that international kind of a mindset where they need to be competitive. This is what I'm saying. They need to be stay competitive and then go out there and compete. Because in the next 10 years, we don't want to be left behind. In the next 20 years, we want our youth to be, you know, the next uh, uh, Steve Jobs. It is, it is possible. It is possible for them to achieve that milestone if we, we empower them and get them to believe in themselves and get them to do things for themselves and they will succeed. That is the kind of words, the kind of word that I, I will leave with them Yeah. Thank you so, so much. So. Before we wrap up, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, Yvonne, is democ democ democracy our solution? It is. The short answer is it's part of the solution, not the entire solution. Um, you know, I very much believe that, you know, the government or leadership style will be a blend of various styles to get the right results, given the situation that you find yourself in. So for example, I was reflecting on this before we came on live, you know, reflecting on the question. And I thought, when you take this COVID lockdown situation, for example, you know, those in the UK in lockdown, stay at home, everybody stays at home, you know, and then you see on the internet, what's happening in India, what's happening in parts of Africa, you know, people have to be going out to actually see if people are on lockdown you know, and they're being sent back home with force. You know, in those situations, you know, democracy, acting according to your own free will, might not be the best, you know. So I always say that democracy is part of the solution, but not the entire solution. Different leadership styles and government, you know, government structures would, would be needed at a given time to ensure that the best result is achieved. Okay. Same question to you, Paul Gray. Your last words. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that democracy is clearly just getting people involved in governance. And um, um, as long as people are involved in governance, it's, it's, it's the way to go. Um, I think the years of auto authoritarianism are past. Um, the years of dictatorship are past. But if you have an opportunity in a democratic environment, you need to be a tough leader and um, you need to make sure that things are done and things are done very well because of posterity and um, don't hide behind the umbrella in the conversation of democracy and do things anyhow because posterity will judge you lastly martin okay so what i would say is for me i don't think uh, uh democracy is a solution for africa 
I think we, we need to we need to unlearn things and relearn things. You know, I don't think I think democracy has done more harm than good. Uh, we need to, as a matter of fact, if we need change, we need to come together as a nation and identify. We have to first of all identify with our culture, identify with our culture, believe in ourselves, have a plan, and that plan. Uh, must be uh, uh, everyone must buy into it. It must be it must be across board. It shouldn't be just one party. It shouldn't be say just one one party. You know, having an interest and carrying on with it, and the other party is against it. So for me, what I would say, we need to unlearn things. Things that we've got to unlearn. Modify the system. And it, I know it's it might not be possible. It will, it wouldn't be uh, it it wouldn't be able to to. Um, uh, it will be possible to uh, for us to make it a reality in the next five, ten years. But the thing is, if we all come together and then come up, agree with a uh, uh, agree to a plan, have a roadmap. I am saying things are going to change. Things are going to change. That roadmap must be a sign of by everyone. It's, it, it doesn't really matter your party affiliation that in the next 20 years we want our youth to be context competitive in the next 20 years we want to come to the country and things might not be that you know might not be the best but at least we will be there we will be there we will be at least com competing and it is possible it is feasible if we relearn things and rearrange stuff that's what i would say thank you so so much my amazing panelists that I'm going to have to invite you back on at some point um, because we need to continue the conversation. There's been so many comments um, that we haven't even been through. I've just quickly, you know, put some up, but there's a lot. People want to know a lot. And I think that we have learned a lot. Um, and I think that, you know, what I've taken away is that, look, it is possible. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, the time is now. And that's something that I keep saying that the time is literally now. We have no time to waste. Uh, we need to take the ball by the horns. And and really, you know, I think us in the diaspora, we do have a part to play. Somebody even put that, you know, the diaspora needs to come up with their own party. Maybe it's time. You never know. Maybe it's time for us to all come together uh, and, and do something like this. But I think that, you know, we have a lot to learn um, and we have a lot to gain uh, as well. So um, thank you so much for joining me on tonight's panel. I can't thank you enough. Um, and um, I will definitely be inviting you on again. I hope that you've enjoyed the show as well and have learned a lot. I will definitely be connecting you all together. Um, and I think that networking is so important. Um, I've learned a lot from uh, Powell Grave. I'm going to be getting some mentorship things from him from a different rem, um, and also from Martin and also from yourself, Yvonne. I think this is the time that we need to be learning from each other. Um, you know, our experiences, we must be sharing them. Um, so thank you so much for joining me on the panel and I will see you very, very soon. Thank, thank you for you. having us. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you. thank you. Guys, I hope that you've enjoyed the show. It's been another amazing, impactful, um, we're filled with solutions and um, I'm hoping that we'll get the panelists back on. Um, because I think that, you know, it's been a good show. It has been a good show. And um, we've learned so much about our history and um, so much about our, you know, democracy um, and, you know, about our politics and about our youth, the youth are ready. Um, and so I can't thank you enough for joining me on the show. A big thank you to Vesta London Beauty for her lip gloss and also to Cassie's Classics for her Jalof seasoning and all purpose. So make sure that you go online um, and buy those products. And a big thank you to Tap Tap Send. Um, anytime that you use um, Tap Tap Send, please use the promo code DENTA and you get five pound as well. And I also want to say a big thank you to Guba, the DENTA show team, to Chrissy, it's Naomi's birthday. Happy birthday, Naomi. God bless you. Um, and to Pearl um, and to everybody that supports um, the DENTA show. I can't thank you enough. And to our regular viewers, Maria, uh, Chapman, Eben, um, and all the new people that are joining us each and every time. Thank you so much for subscribing. Thank you so much for sharing. And I will see you next week where we will be talking about mental health. We will be talking about land issue and we'll be diving more into mortgages in Ghana. So I will see you next week, same time, same place. God bless.